Yes, sir. I radioed for backup, got out of my patrol vehicle, and approached the defendant's vehicle. Then when did you search for the gun? Objection. Absolutely no foundation. Furthermore, the prosecutor, though well-meaning, is leading the witness just a trifle. Sustained. Please rephrase your question. What happened that night, officer? Objection. Now counsel is calling for a narrative. Sustained. Rephrase. Did you see anything as you approached the defendant's vehicle? Yes. Located in plain view under the back of the driver's seat was what appeared to be the stock of a rifle or shotgun. I immediately ordered the defendant out of his vehicle and retrieved the weapon. Did you examine the weapon? Yes, I did. It was a 12-gauge shotgun. The barrel was warm and it smelled. Well, Frank, we've been expecting you. When did you get in? Uh, uh, just now. Uh, how are we doing? We're all doing fine. Hmm. Courtroom of the future, huh? That's what we hope. First time you've seen it? Actually, yes, I've been over the plans a dozen times, but I wanted to get a look at it before the uh, dedication. Because I really want to see Frank Jr. in action. Now, how's all this video work? Well, the courtroom is configured so that the jury faces the proceedings. Notice the television monitor in front of them. Oh, uh, Mr. Beat, huh? If the attention of any one of the jury stray from the proceedings, he can immediately focus on the monitor, which is covering the action. From this room, they record every single thing that goes on in the courtroom. I should get you an assistant. Hey, the way I got this place rigged, nobody can run it but me. Keeps me indispensable. <laughs> Let's go. <clears throat> the shotgun was located in plain view. Now, you're telling us, Sergeant, that a man who's been painted by the prosecution as having planned his entire crime with military precision speeds from the vicinity of the crime at 90 miles an hour with the alleged murder weapon in plain view? <laughs> Do you think we are idiots here? Is it not true, sir, that last year in three separate criminal trials, you testified to discovering evidence in plain view and that subsequent investigation revealed that you had indeed planted such evidence? And weren't you subsequently tried for perjury? What? Mr. Wellman, you're out of order. I'm not out of order. Answer the question. Yes, I was tried for perjury, but I was acquitted. The jury will disregard this last piece of testimony. You can't instruct the jury to disregard. There's been no objection and no motion to strike. The court makes its own objection and orders the testimony to be stricken. Therefore, the jury will disregard. Satisfied, Mr. Wellman? And where are your objections, Mr. Prosecutor? Hmm? Don't let all this power go to your head, Jeff. I'm through. We'll stand recess until tomorrow. <laughs> well, I call that aggressive advocacy. And I'd agree with you. Uh, sorry, Frank, but I have to get back to work. I really appreciate you coming to teach a seminar. I know Frank Jr. feels the same about having you for a teacher. I'll be seeing you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Wanna have dinner? Yeah, all right. No, you know, I, I, I'd better stay back here and, and work on my summation a little bit. It's okay. Well, breakfast at my hotel. Okay? All right. Now, give him hell, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I don't believe what I just saw. It borders on the incomprehensible. Mr. McDonald, you had grounds for objection. Mr. Wellman badgered your witness and extracted inadmissible evidence. Now, where were you? I thought if I gave Frank enough rope, he'd hang himself. That isn't good enough. I expect Scott thought that the judge would have called Frank on it. Miss McDonald, you're his sister, and your loyalty is commendable. But, Mr. McDonald, as a prosecutor, your duty is to prevent defense counsel from misusing the rules of evidence. Don't smile, Frank. If Jeff had been doing his job, you'd be cited for contempt. I agree. You're clever and articulate, Mr. Wellman. 
But a jury is a complex organism, just a group of ordinary people. They haven't studied Aristotelian logic. Their individual honesty may come and go as it does for all of us. When they become a jury, they take on an intelligence that you must never underestimate and an integrity that you must never, never insult. Until tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank you for your comments, Mr. Mason. It is an honor being in your class. I'll remember what you said. Thank you. And Frank. When you make your summation tomorrow, use some sincerity. Ken. Look, I know I've been remote, but I need to see you. Well, that's quite a change. Don't make it any more difficult, please. Okay. Okay. How about now? I'm sorry, I can't. Scott and I have some things to do. Kimberly, what is the matter? Why can't you just come out and tell me? Ken, why don't you give her a break? Scott, please. Just try to understand. I'd like to. Last week, you were in love with me. Now I can't get you on the phone. I leave messages in your study, Carol, which you don't return. If it weren't for this damn mock trial, I wouldn't see you at all. Kim. Don't listen to your brother. For once, do what you want. Come see me tonight. I don't get it. Around 7 o'clock, okay? con law exam or how about those broncos or maybe ken the reason i've been treating you so bad is because i'm schizo i'll be in the library well this was a mistake i'm sorry i never should have had you come kimberly tell him tell what? him wait a minute just leave her alone, Wait Ken. A minute. Just leave What's her alone. What's wrong with her? What's going on? It's Frank. He's the reason she's been acting so strange. What's he got to do with it? I probably shouldn't be telling you this, but a couple of nights ago, he came up to her in the library, and he wanted to talk to her about some pretrial motions for the uh, moot court. Moot court doesn't have pretrial motions. No kidding. But you know that he's been crazy about her since the first year, right? Anyway, they went over to the Ivy to have some beers. Before you know it, he's drunk, too drunk to drive, and uh, she had to drive him home. Go on. 
all of a sudden he uh, he threw her down on the floor, ripped open her blouse, and tried to rape her. He didn't. No, she fought him off, but he he really hurt her. I mean, I woke up because I heard her crying in the bathroom. She made me promise not to say anything. She was so scared. Ken, that's the reason she hasn't wanted to see you. She's afraid that all of you... Ken! Couldn't see who it was. Whether it was a man or a woman. Are you aware it was your knife that was used to kill him? My knife? It had your initials on it. Mr. Mason, someone stole that knife from me two weeks ago. You don't believe me? There are several top defense attorneys in Denver. I'll speak to one first thing in the morning. I called you. Ken, I'll find you the very best. Look, sir, I want to be a lawyer. I worked hard to get into this school, and I don't want it taken away from me for something I didn't do. You always told us that the accused is entitled to the best possible defense. And you're the best defense attorney I could have. I'm innocent, damn it. And I, just, and I need someone to believe that. Mostly you. That's a hell of a thing, isn't it? This is our law school, Perry, yours and mine. Gets killed here. Frank, don't think about it. You would have been a good lawyer, wouldn't you? More than good. We had our problems. Any kid does today. I was so proud of him. He was doing such a terrific job. Turned his whole life around. The young man accused of the murder phoned me 
I went to see him. He confessed? He wants me to represent him. What did you say? I told him no. I'm not sure it was the right thing to do. No. It's other good lawyers. He asked for me. Frank, if I walk away from this young man... Because of our friendship, hmm? Now, isn't that enough? I don't know. Next in order, People versus Ken Melansky. Are the people ready? Marilyn Anson of the District Attorney's Office. The people are ready, Your Honor. And do you have counsel, Mr. Melansky? No, Your Honor. And this proceeding will be put over. If it's a matter of expense, the state will provide a lawyer. Do you wish this court to appoint one for you? That won't be necessary, Your Honor. I recognize you, Mr. Mason. And what are you doing here? I'm representing the defendant. Understated, yet beautiful. Roses are absolutely gorgeous. Thank you. I was describing you. The roses are the least I could do for cutting your trip short. Oh, the cruise. Mm-hmm, yes. Starry nights, tropical skies, gourmet food, and the best big band since the immortal Glenn Miller. After four days, I was so bored I could have jumped ship, even without your call. I am more than appreciative. Mm -hmm. How are you? And uh, how's poor Mr. Wellman? Well, Frank's taking taking it very hard. Uh, his boy mm -hmm. was his whole life. Della, I want you to look into Frank Jr.'s past. See who else might have had a motive. Any idea where to start? Two days before the murder, he allegedly tried to rape Ken Melansky's girlfriend. Allegedly? Her name's Kimberly. Kimberly McDonald. She's also a law student. Same class as Frank Jr. I want you to talk to Kimberly. Ryan. Perry. How does Frank Wellman feel about this? I'm, I mean, you're representing Ken Malinsky. He doesn't know yet. Ooh. I'm going to need all the background you can get me on the students in my class. Mm -hmm. Give me ten minutes, I'll be right on it. I want you to rent a car. Meet me at the courthouse. Ken's being arraigned this afternoon. Anything else? Why, yes. There's a list on the desk. We have two choices. One is to ignore the tragedy that occurred here. The way we've been sitting here pretending that tape isn't there? Or we can look closely at all of it. You mean make Ken's defense part of the class? Not exactly. But there's a great deal we can learn from what's happened. But suppose Ken's lying. Suppose he's actually guilty. Every defendant comes into court presumed innocent. Now, what's my first line of attack? Ken said someone was already here when he came in. 
Besides Frank, I mean. Well, if Ken didn't do it, then that man was the murderer. Or a woman. A good start. However, the security guard claims he was on duty all night. He let no one else in here except Frank. Where does that leave us? In deep trouble. The classic murder in a locked room. Then what becomes the critical question? Where the person hid? Mr. McDonald? No. Who knew Frank would be here that night? Very good. Who would have known? The only people who'd know for sure would be the people in this class. Who else? You knew. Yes, I did. And Frank's father? And the security guard? All right, let's strike the three of us from the list of suspects. What is your inevitable conclusion? One of us is the killer. But we all left together. Did you? I left with Scott. And then we both saw Ken outside. Did anyone see me leave? I ran into you at the cafeteria. Fine, then we're each other's alibi. Yes. That leaves me. I left alone. Actually, I saw you from the window of my office getting into your car in the parking lot. If nobody hid in here, where does that leave us? Miss Lehman. There's got to be another key. Right. So one of us has to be the killer. Right. Now, please consider that until our next meeting. In fact, since I'm now defending Ken Malansky, expect me to intrude on each one of you at any time. That's all, thank you. Congratulations. What for? Getting our interest. You certainly put us all in the middle of Ken's defense. And your own. The um, court has reviewed counsel's motion for bail, as well as the people's response. We find the defendant has no ties to this jurisdiction beyond his enrollment in school here. No residence, no job, no family. Therefore, flight is a real possibility. The crime that he's been charged with is a capital offense. Accordingly, the court sets bail at $250,000. Thank you, Your Honor. Why didn't you just say 10 million or 20? There's no way. Uh, Marshal, I'd like a minute with my client. Take as much time as you want. His bail's made. Are you sure? Bell Bondsman came in here before the hearing, guaranteed any amount up to a million. Damnedest thing. Hey! What do you think you're doing here? Paying your bail. Why? Kenny, there's been something I've been desperate to say to you, and... Well, I, I couldn't bear to do it if you were behind bars. There's nothing, absolutely nothing that you have to say to me. Nothing. Except this. Young lady. Who? I'm his fiance, of course. Of course. We were never engaged. On the technicality that you never gave me a ring. On the technicality that I never proposed. Mr. Mason, you strike me as a fair-minded man. May I ask you a question? No. If a man says to you, I love you, I can't live without you, I want to be together forever. I never what? said that. Exactly. Miss Hastings, first a quarter of a million dollars bail, then physical assault, then verbal assault. I'd say you were sending Ken a mixed message. I mean, what is it I want? Mm -hmm. For public consumption, after he ran out on me, I told everyone I tossed him out and never wanted to see him again. But privately, honestly, don't tell Ken because he's already too conceited, but I'm still crazy about him. Your secret is safe with me. Mr. 
Mr. Mason. Ken may be what my grandmother used to call a cad. Lord knows he's not terribly bright. But he's not a killer. And on the romantic front, I intend to pursue you until you catch me. <laughs> Does she always approach life this simply? Today she was a little reserved. Meeting you, I guess. Tell me, you really ran out on her? You may have guessed her family's rich, not rich like Wellman. We're talking generations, money with a pedigree. That bothered you? No, I've got nothing against being rich. I'd like to be rich. And I was in love with her, was. Then she started making all these plans about what I do, what we do. So when the scholarship to law school came along, I told her it couldn't work out. Obviously, there's no feeling left. None. None at all. I'm in love with Kimberly. Your first year here, most of your professors called you brilliant. Then all your drive seemed to disappear. You refused law review. Something must have happened. I'd like to know what that was. Lots of people are first-year wonders, then they burn out. And some make remarkable progress, like Frank Wellman. I know. never have stayed in school without help. Someone coached him, probably even wrote his papers for him, sacrificed her own career for him. How did you know? Was it that obvious? To me it was. The way you looked at him was. first time I saw Frank, I was sitting on the law school steps, eating my lunch out of a paper sack. It was the second week of class, and he was just arriving to register because he had been in Europe on vacation. Anyway, he, uh, he got out of a sports car that cost more than a Wall Street lawyer makes in a year. The sun was behind him, and he, he almost glowed. I thought to myself, even with the top down, his hair looked perfect. <laughs> he, of course, didn't even know I existed. Until the class standings came out. He, uh, came to my study, Carol, the next day. I, uh, I spent that night in his apartment and, um... I was there three nights a week, every week after that. Yes, I knew exactly what was going on, and no, I wasn't kidding myself, but a couple of weeks ago, he told me that it was over. I knew it was coming. I mean, I knew it was inevitable, but I didn't turn out to be as tough as I thought I was. And after he rejected you, he assaulted your roommate. Yes. You told Ken deliberately, didn't you? You really wanted him to hurt Frank. Oh. Oh, it's not the way you make it sound. I mean, <laughs> I loved him. <laughs> I'm still in love with him right now. I wanted Ken to hurt him. But I never wanted him dead. You've got to believe me. I'd like to. If Ken needs me, tell him I'm at the library, okay?
Hey, Travis. Me. Where you been? Got out on bail yesterday. Two hundred fifty thousand bucks. You never guess who paid it. That girl I went out with before, Kimberly. The crazy one. Well, she's still crazy. Hurry up, Blair. I just got back from the gym. Hi. Hi. I'm surprised you're still talking to me under the circumstances. I'm so incredibly sorry about all this. I know what you're going through. I just want you to know that I believe in you. Ken, what is it? Excuse me. I, I don't mean to interrupt. I Actually, I, I didn't hear you come in because of the shower which I was taking because the water pressure at my hotel is so awful. Isn't that typical? <sighs> Kenny, can you get me a, a towel for, for my hair? Because You must be Travis's new girlfriend. Travis? My roommate? Your boyfriend? <sighs> <laughs> oh, he's so gallant. <laughs> Trying to protect your sensitivity. Actually, I'm not anybody's new anything. Dress, I'm his yourself. fiance. What? His almost fiance. You're the girl that broke his heart. You told her that? How sweet. Amy paid my bail yesterday. Call me crazy. I beg your pardon. How'd you get in here? Travis let me in. I told him we were very old, very dear friends. He was surprised. He said you'd never mention my name. I was a little hurt. Anyway, I just felt horrible after I left today because no matter how terrible you were, physical violence is never the answer. Physical violence? Her idea of a joke. I slugged him. A solid left. Of course, I was immediately overcome with remorse, so I came by today to apologize, and then I felt a little grubby, so I decided to take a shower. I should really leave. I'm sure you two have a lot to talk about. No, no, we, we don't, honestly. You're his new girlfriend. Kenny, I can't be jealous. She's lovely. Are you a law student also? That's right. And smart, too. I better go. I just came by to let you know I'm here if you need me. I think that's terrific. Amy? It was very nice meeting you. What the? Ken, did you really tell her I broke your heart? I told her you were spoiled, selfish, self-centered, irresponsible. Stop! I now remember how relieved I was I didn't actually marry you. From now on, my interest in you is strictly financial. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I intend to protect my money. I'm not letting you out of my sight. The aftermath of murder can be a tedious business, Mr. McDonald. You're not an easy man to find. You make it sound like I'm trying to avoid you. That would make sense if you were the killer. Except I've got no motive. The man tried to rape your sister. I know. But you didn't tell me. How old were the two of you when your parents died? We were only three. Just out of curiosity. Who's older? I am. Twelve minutes. Guess that makes me the big brother. You're really inseparable, aren't you? Same <laughs> undergraduate college. Kimberly even came to the same law school. Yes, that's right. So you want me to believe that she didn't tell you that Wellman assaulted her? If you don't believe me, why don't you ask her? Hello, Mr. Wilson. Are you all right? Yes, it's just... <sighs> I hope I'm not interrupting, but are you about finished? Just winding up. Why don't you walk me out? He probably wants to ask you some questions alone. 
You're quite correct. Okay. You still think the killer was someone from our seminar? They are the only ones who knew Frank was staying in the courtroom. Mr. Mason, rather than just sitting around, would it be okay if I went back to the courtroom? Checked it out? All right, Ken, I'll arrange it, but I want you to be careful. Right. There's uh, one other thing. It's Kimberly. Actually, it's Kimberly and Amy. You noticed. It's hard to miss. Kimberly's a terrific girl. Lord knows she's pretty. And then there's Amy. She's crazy. I mean, she can be wonderful, too. She posted my bail, and I'm grateful. But she's out of control. I never know what she's going to do next. Some people call that exciting. I know. If you're asking for my advice, I think right now, you have to concentrate on the trial. You mean give them both up? I mean make a choice. And stick to it. Right. Thanks. I didn't know you were such a basketball fan. Right now, the only scouting I'm doing is for a murder suspect. <laughs> this will be the shortest interview you ever get. I got no motive. That's not what the law firm of O'Malley and Kern would say. Listen, it's true I wanted the summer job there. That's a very prestigious firm. It's also true I was disappointed, but I got over it. Before or after you beat up Frank Wilman? He told them I had a drug problem. That the reason I didn't try for the pros was I test positive. That must have made you very angry. It was a lie. All of it. I didn't try for the pros. Be I didn't try for the pros because I knew I wasn't good enough. He knew that. And that big-time firm would only take one guy from our class. And even with his dad's pull, he couldn't buy his way in. Unless he got rid of me first. If you had gotten that job, it could have meant a great placement after graduation. Frank was a bastard. <laughs> Look, I'll be real honest with you. I'm not sorry Frank's dead. There's something else I'll be straight about. I didn't kill him. Here's something I'll be straight about. You're still angry enough to have killed him. Something I want to ask you. Something I want you to do. You picked a hell of a time to propose. I really appreciate you putting up my bail. It was a terrific thing to do. Why do I think the next word is but? But I want you to leave. It's just too distracting having you around. Distract you for whom? You or Kimberly? This has nothing to do with anybody else. I'm on trial for murder. I'm in trouble. Oh. I just can't think about anything else. Come on. You don't believe me. Kenny, it doesn't matter. It's okay, I understand. Look, I love to joke around, but I am serious about one thing. Wanting what's best for you and for you to be happy. <laughs> I guess that's two things, isn't it? <laughs> Thanks. There's just one more thing. What?
can't understand what's keeping Perry. Oh, he was like that even in law school. You know, nobody worked harder. What was he really like in those days? He was a grind. Nose in the book all the time. No time for anything else. Of course, it was people like him that made people like me quit the law and go into business. So. Have you ever had any regrets on that decision? I've been pretty lucky. Um, about most things, I guess. Oh, Frank, it was a terrible tragedy. We're both so very sorry. Well, hello. I'm going to talk to you, Perry. I'll get the uh, pretrial motions in your office. 37 years. We've been friends 37 years, and you're going to represent this boy that murdered my son? I think he's innocent. I read the police reports. He's guilty as hell. How can you do this to me? Ken Milansky wanted me to defend him. Our relationship should have nothing to do with that. Oh. Well, why are you doing this in-depth investigation of Frank Jr.? What are you going to do, put him on trial? Well, that's a standard defense tactic, isn't it, when you don't have a case? Huh? Try the victim? Well, I'm not going to stand by while you drag my boy through the mud. I believe Ken Milansky is innocent. I'm entitled to every fact I can find. I'm entitled to search everywhere, even into your son's life. Well, I'm entitled, as an old friend, to ask you to stop. The boy's dead. I appreciate your grief. I even share it. I have no desire to make it any worse. <sighs> Disappointed in you, Perry. I'm very sorry. I have no choice. Who's there? Slam the door on a man bringing you flowers, could you? They're lovely, thank you. But I have to study. Can't you take five minutes to hear an apology? Kimberly, I know how it must have looked when Amy came out of the shower the other day. Looked? Okay. Sounded like. Felt like. But it isn't. What I had with her is over. Everyone at school knows your bail was set at a quarter of a million dollars. I mean, no one would put that kind of money... I told her to leave. That was less than an hour ago. Now, what do you say? I don't know. Maybe I can take a study break. about in an hour what is your problem i gotta check something out on the case i'll be back hurry back i'll be back i'll be waiting You promised me you were leaving. I most certainly did not. I told you I wanted what was best for you. Just obviously my help. Are you going to give me a hand up or not? 
right to the door. You're not hearing my theory? I don't even want to think about any theory you might have. It's obvious that you need me. Your brain is so fogged in from that vapid co-ed from law school, so I guess I'll just wait till you beg me to tell you, Kenny! heard every possible phony story like I owe this man money so I've got to find him or he's my baby brother who ran away to sea and I'm searching for him so I'm gonna be completely honest with you there's this man I absolutely have to locate and he's wearing the same sweatshirt as you are lady you want information you pick up the phone and dial 411 I guess the kindest way to describe him would be sort of a badly dressed weasel mid-twenties <laughs> Around here, people savor their anonymity. What about a bribe? I know. An ugly word. However, I am willing to lay down on this bar 50... No. No, make that $100. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Well, then I guess I just have one more question. What are you serving for lunch? Burgers. Oh, I don't eat burgers. I'm a vegetarian. Burgers. You know what my favorite sandwich is? Fried egg. All I got is burgers. You have eggs. I can see them right there. Some guys like to put them in their beer. I realize this, this may seem just a little unorthodox, but I was just... Excuse me, what's your name? Al. Oh. Is that short for Alvin or Albert? Maybe Albert? <laughs> At any rate, could you just help me out with this? Oh, lady, uh... How would it be if I made my own sandwich? Uh, I'd pay you, of course. Are you crazy? No, not seriously crazy. Just a few questions, Mr. Morgan. Fire away. Tell me, do you have your key ring on your belt? Yeah, I sure do. Every key I own's here, even the one to the moot courtroom. Never without it. You never separated from your key ring? No, sir. But you lost your keys the night of the murder, did you not? Well, yeah, he took them from me. He? Is that the only time you've been separated from your keys? Yes, sir. <laughs> so, no one... No one could have made a duplicate of the key to the rear door of the building. No, it's absolutely impossible. Tell me, Mr. Morgan, where do you live? Uh, 113 Live Oak Terrace. It's a, a fancy address for a little condo building. Is that one of those buildings with a security system? Yes, sir, it's got an alarm. About two months ago, did the alarm 
go off because someone broke into your unit? Well, not exactly. But the police were called and a report was made, was it not? Yeah. Um, the city charged me $45 for a, a false alarm because I... I had to break into my own unit. Mr. Morgan, why on earth would you break into your own unit? You've told us your keys are always with you. Well, this time they weren't. I uh, must have misplaced them. Must have misplaced them? Well, all right, I did. I lost them, but uh, I got them back. For how long were they lost? A few hours, a day, a week, a month? Well, it's not very... Long enough for someone to make a duplicate key to the rear door of the building? Objection, speculation. Sustained. Sam, we both know that if someone had a key to the rear door, that person could have entered the back of the courtroom without your knowledge. Now, isn't that true? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Redirect? No, no, Your Honor. And this court will recess for one hour. So, things with Ken are really getting serious. Romance turned to passion. Passion heading towards commitment. Of course, my parents didn't approve. But I was determined, so I brought them home for Christmas. A fatal mistake. One burger, red but not cold, pickles, onions, tomatoes on the side. Anyway, so we came down to dinner the first night with my entire family poised and waiting. Hey, Amy. And then... Weasel at 2 o'clock. Thanks. Excuse me. I think this is my game. Yeah, says who? Says Ben Franklin. Don't be so shy. We met last night. I don't know who you are. <laughs> well, that's because you ran away. Now, who starts? I'll break. Last night when I caught you breaking into the moot courtroom... Look, I... lady, I wasn't there. Eugene, my unimpeachable sources tell me that you're in charge of the video room. Now, on the night of the murder, someone was in that room. So I went back there... And I found something. But I guess it must not belong to you. Oh, too bad. Is it my shot now? What? Uh, what, what do you think you found? I think I liked it better when you were pretending to be a tough guy, Eugene. Well, what I found was... Oh, it's not my own stick. Well, what I found, way in back of one of the files where you hid it, a pirate copy of the hottest movie out right now. Let me have it. I'll cut you in. Oh, you don't have to do that. I'll give it to you. What do you want? A few answers. Don't look so worried. The questions are not that hard. And then I get the tape? Cross my heart. When? Tonight. 8 p.m. Shea Charlotte. Until then, it's in a very safe place. Your Honor, I realize this shouldn't happen. I'm sorry. It's inexcusable calling a surprise witness. Your Honor, the district attorney has had ample time to prepare her case. Did you know this witness existed? Yes, we did. But we had no idea he had information relevant to the case. Mr. Mason. Your Honor, if this witness testifies, I'd like an adjournment immediately following that testimony. I'll need the entire weekend to prepare a cross-examination. Sounds fair to me. What could you possibly testify to? We'll soon find out. I thought it was your friend. Maybe. That's a big maybe.
Raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. State your name for the record. Tra <clears throat> Travis Charles Howe. Mr. Howe, where do you reside? I share an apartment off campus with the defendant, Ken Malansky. And how long have you known the defendant? Oh, we met the first year of law school. We've been roommates the last two. I show you People's Exhibit 7, a knife previously identified as the murder weapon, and ask you if you saw it somewhere on the night of the murder. Yes, in our apartment. And how did you happen to see it? Well, I, I was in the apartment studying, and all of a sudden, Ken blew in like a hurricane. I, I, I have never seen anyone so mad. He was opening drawers and, and going through his closet, and the whole time he was yelling about... Uh, about, about what Frank had done to Kimberly. And did he find what he was looking for? Yes, in his backpack. It was the knife. What happened then? Well, he said he wanted to find Frank. What did you do? Well, uh, the whole time he was looking, I, I was trying to calm him down. When he said that about finding Frank, I tried to stop him. Then what happened? He pushed me down and told me to stay out of it. He said... He... He said he was going to get Frank. And then he left. Mr. Howe... Why didn't you come forward sooner with this information? I, I'd gone to see Ken when he was in jail. He was really nervous. He, he told me to lie about the knife. He's my roommate. He, he's my friend. I, I, I thought I was doing the right thing. <laughs> Thank you. No further questions at this time, Your Honor. Pursuant to stipulation, this court is now in recess until Monday morning at 10 a.m. Mr. Howe, you're instructed to return to the stand at that time. You may step down. Court is adjourned. Never went back to the court. Mr. Mason, please control Why your you lying, client Travis? he'll be held in contempt. Damn, what are you trying to do to me? Get! I decided to forgive you instead of leaving because I have wonderful news. I doubt it. I made a major breakthrough in the case. Amy, I had kind of a rough day, okay? I want to hear about it. You can tell me while we're driving. All right. Have it your way. But I should tell you that we have an appointment to meet the real killer. I invited him to join us for dinner. I think someone at the law school killed Frank for a personal motive. What if it was almost like an accident? You really think it was Eugene? Well, think about it. He's up there using the tape equipment in a felonious manner, and Frank walks in on him. Things get rowdy, and Eugene nails him. With my knife? <laughs> oh. Good point. Well, we'll see. Don't you think we ought to let Mr. Mason in on our little adventure? And please, let's not bother Mr. Mason until we have something tangible. That's pretty good. The seafood's a specialty here. Is it nice? Okay. I thought you said this was a popular place. Best in town. And where is everybody? Oh, I bought out the first city. First what? Don't worry. This is a secret meeting with a murder suspect. We couldn't have a lot of people around. Here he comes. Did you 
bring the tape? What is this, Jean? No hello? How's it going? No drink first, just to be social? I believe you've met Ken. And yes, I have brought the tape. Provided you've brought some answers. We know you were in the video room the night of the murder. You're the one who ran out, weren't you? I wasn't. Can you prove that? I was with the guys that want that tape. Where is it? Not so fast, Eugene. We're not finished yet. Did you see anybody else that night? I told you I wasn't there. Now, could I have the tape? No. You're making a mistake. I don't think so. We'll see. What do you mean by that? I don't know. What do we do now? Regroup. Check, please. I'll get the car. about the murder but take some good advice forget you ever saw me because the guys i work for are really mean they'll kill you and enjoy it are you all right i can't wait to hear your next play come here it's all right mr howard that map of the city sets forth among other things the area around the law school. That familiar to you? Yes, sir, it is. Now, Kimberly McDonald swore that on the evening of the murder, my client left her apartment at uh, 1162 Long Ridge Road at five minutes after seven. Please mark the map accordingly. Don't forget the time. Now, where is the law school? Right here. The security officer on the scene testified he walked into the moot court at 721 and discovered Ken Melansky standing next to the body of Frank Wellman, Jr. Now, sir, when did you see Ken at your apartment? Which is where? Um, right here. I, I don't know exactly, uh, about quarter past seven. A lot, a lot of things were happening. I didn't look at my watch. That means Mr. Melansky drove from Kimberly's apartment to your apartment to the law school in 16 minutes. Now, you've lived in this town for three years. Is it really possible to do that? Well, it'd be tight, but yeah, you could do it. Now, what if Ken Melansky was driving in a reckless manner? and got pulled over by the police at Moore Park and Fourth. I'll wait for you, Mr. Howe. Please mark your map. Now, what if he got a ticket at Moore Park and Fourth? Would he still have had time for that trip? I wouldn't know. Well, assume the ticket was written at 7.12 and the officer took five minutes to write it. How would that be possible when you say at that very moment, Ken Melansky was tearing up your apartment looking for his knife? There's no answer to your question because it's hypothetical. 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 No, Mr. Howe. Here is the ticket Mr. Melansky received at exactly 7.12. Now, perhaps you'd like to review your recollection of that evening. 
The location where he got the ticket is in a direct line between Kimberly's apartment and the law school. Now, what would Ken be doing there? I don't know. He was going directly from Kimberly's to the law school. He never went home, he never searched for the knife, and you never saw him. Isn't that true, Mr. Howe? Mr. Howe. You have one last chance to reconsider your testimony. I assume you know the penalties for perjury. Um, maybe I... Maybe I, I'm mistaken about what happened that evening. More than mistaken, Mr. Howe. I have no further questions. At this time, Your Honor, the people request a brief recess. We'll reconvene in 15 minutes. Brilliant piece of work, Harry. Someone's trying to hang my client. Travis? He was working for somebody else? Unfortunately, neither of you could have known about the speeding ticket. What are you talking about? Would you like me to show you a letter from his bank? After you met with him four days ago, a large sum of money went into his account. Now, I want to know what the hell you thought you were doing. Harry... Ken Melansky is innocent. He's guilty. He killed my son. Frank? Getting Travis Howe to perjure himself is a crime. What are you going to do, send me to jail? I call Frank Wellman to the stand. You know, sir, that you have my deepest sympathy, but I must ask you some difficult questions. Your son did well at law school. Was that something of a surprise? No. He was a hard worker. But he did have a rather poor undergraduate record, did he not? Well, he wasn't the kind of boy who spends his Saturday nights in the library. He enjoyed people. He liked to party, drank quite a bit. Was arrested many times for drunk driving, was he not? He was never convicted for driving under the influence. Never. Why not, Mr. Wellman? Mr. Wellman, why not? I spoke to friends who could understand what a thing like that would mean on his record. I took responsibility. You used your influence to get him off. You might say that. And when he broke a young man's neck in a bar fight, Mr. Wellman? I was settled out of court. Isn't it true that your son was spoiled and violent? That he never had to face up to life because you provided more... My son... My son loved me, and he would have done anything for me. I would have done anything for him as well. Your Honor, the state fails to see the relevancy of this whole line of questioning. The people will stipulate that the decedent came from a rich family, if that's what Mr. Mason is after. It is not, Your Honor. I'm exploring the character of the decedent to show that someone other than my client may have had motive. The court will allow this on the representation that counsel will connect it up.
One last question. Did you buy your son's way into law school? No, I did not. You did make several large contributions while his application was pending, did you not? One for more than a million dollars for the moot courtroom? I did what any father would have done for his son. The difference being that I had the money to do it with. No further questions, Your Honor. I thank the witness for his honesty. We'll take our lunch recess at this time. Court will be adjourned until one o'clock. Can wait for me outside. I'll take that letter now. I paid for it. Yes, I believe you did. This isn't from a bank. This is a damned fundraiser for the law school. That's right, Frank. It's a hell of a way to treat a friend. Friend. Here it is, just like I promised. Good. And it's not that I don't trust you, but... No, it wasn't easy to get it, but when I make a promise to you, Answer Vic, you question. can count on me to follow through with it. Are you crazy? What the hell are you trying to do? There's some mistake. She promised me that it... Mistake? Oh, there's definitely been a mistake. My mistake. I could have got some pros to pirate for me, but no, I trust you. I even send you to video school. And why? Because you're from the neighborhood. And I like it. But that's just the kind of guy that I am. Vic, let me In a moment, Eugene. There's something you have to understand. You swore to me that you could break the transfer codes and give me the three-quarter inch mask. Will you turn the damn thing off? It's giving me a headache. The three-quarter inch mask is for the guy in Rio who's going to pay me $100,000 for every master tape from that movie. And now, you're forcing me to... I know where it is. Give me one more chance. All right. You got 12 hours. And after that, we'll make a different kind of movie. A snuff film. I don't know if this was such a hot idea. If I didn't come, he wouldn't show up. No, Amy, that's not what I mean. Don't you think the limo is a little overstated? You try and hail a cab in this area. Eugene, you made me a rich woman. I bet Ken, you'd really be here. Pay up. Put it on my tab. That makes $250,005 I owe you. You gave me the wrong tape. Are you trying to get me killed? Those guys want to take my head off. You didn't tell us what we want to know. Tough. Give me the tape. Eugene, where are your manners? Ken, make him say please. Yeah, say please. This time I decided not to take any chances. Let's step outside. Let me give you some free legal advice. Right now, all we got on you is pirating video cassettes. Make us go someplace we don't want to go. Then we're talking major felony territory. I'll take it under advisement. Now move. Last chance. This place is full of cops. Encourage her to shut up. Police! Three! Hold it!
sir. Damn you! So we're in the courtroom the night of the murder. Who was? How do I know? Thank you, Dean. Now someone from the class must have been there. I don't know. They're getting closer. It would be a shame if you were to fall. Wait, wait. Uh, this kid paid me to show him how to use the equipment. Maybe it was him. What's his name? Oh, thank heavens you're back. Everything turned out fine. Good. Well, I can't say I approve of you two playing detective, but there's nothing like results. Well, the night is still young. Is there anything else we can do? She has the limo booked for the entire evening. You should be in bed, asleep. I want him looking fresh and relaxed and innocent in the morning. I'll give it a shot. <laughs> On our way. <laughs> bye bye. They make a lovely couple. Yeah, I suppose. What's the matter? We're missing something. I don't know what it is, but there's something missing. If you need me for anything. Harry. Good night. It's just a trifle. Dane, please rephrase your question. What happened that night, officer? Objection now, counsel is calling for a narrative. Sustained. Listen, uh, thanks for everything. What did I do? Just risk my life to save you. It was nothing, really. I'm really very grateful. That's why I did it. For a little simple gratitude. Looking innocent, I guess you'd better. We call Scott McDonald to the stand. Mr. McDonald, I've been looking at your record. I notice you do much better in classes where you write papers instead of taking tests for your grade. Now, why is that? Sometimes, sometimes I clutch under pressure, I guess. The paper in your hand is one on which you received an A. It's on constitutional law. Do you mind reading aloud page three, paragraph two? Yet is, it is the creation of a constitutional government structured by a deep separation of powers that significantly marks the profound conviction born of experience that, that human, human beings occupying positions of leadership must, must be restrained by forces more potent than their own 
arbitrary discretion. I'm sorry you stopped, Mr. McDonald. Mr. Justice Lattimore has always been a favorite of mine. Yours too, I take it. Now, you plagiarized that paper from him, did you not? Yes. What did your sister say when she found out? She must have been very angry. Yes, she was. Frank Wellman, Jr. knew about your cheating. Isn't that so? No, no, he didn't. Did he not? The videotape of the moot court trial shows that this book of Lattimore on Frank's table wasn't needed for the trial. He had it there so you'd see it. So that you'd be constantly reminded that he could expose you. Once exposed, he'd have been thrown out of school, never to practice law, never to be law partners with your sister. That's not true. He told you to throw the trial, did he not? Kimberly and I were beating him. We were going to win. No, you were not. I was there, remember? I didn't understand why you were doing so badly. Now we know, don't we? Mr. McDonald, I was the last person to leave the courtroom on the night of the murder. And this book was there, on the table. But in the police photos of the crime scene, this book is gone. Only the killer could have taken it. Your Honor, can't you see he's badgering the witness? Young lady, please be quiet. Mr. Mason. You, uh, framed Ken Malansky, did you not? No. Mr. McDonald, this is a preliminary hearing. But suppose it were a full jury trial. This jury box would have 12 people in it. 12 people, all looking at you, listening to you, staring at you. 12 people sitting here, watching and waiting for the truth. Now, Mr. McDonald, the courtroom video technician is prepared to testify that you paid him quite a lot of money to teach you how to use the equipment. Now, this videotape shows Frank Wellman Jr. rehearsing his summation in the moot court. Mr. McDonald, you were the one person capable of operating that video equipment who knew that Frank Wellman Jr. would be there that night. Now, you taped Frank Wellman doing that summation, did you not? Don't say anything, Scott. I will not tolerate your behavior, young lady. Your Honor, Miss McDonald's Vocal outbursts have been a great puzzlement to me, but I think I'm no longer perplexed. It's her brother. Our witness, Scott McDonald, has to be in constant communication with his sister. He feels compelled beyond reason to see her, and if he cannot do that, he needs to hear her voice. Here is a copy of the tape. I give it to you. Mr. McDonald, it took two people to commit this crime. Your sister manipulated her roommate, Donna Lehman, making sure Ken would come to the courtroom. You made sure it would appear that Frank Wellman was still alive by playing that tape. Everyone has thought you dominated your sister. But that's not true, is it, Scott? She's the reason you're here today. She wanted revenge for the assault by Frank Wellman. And you were willing because of the blackmail. Isn't that true, Scott? Isn't it? Uh, 
Listen to me, Scott. Are you going to pay for a crime you did not commit alone? No. I didn't kill him. People move to dismiss the charges against Kenneth Malansky. Yeah. Case dismissed. Miss Prosecutor, I direct you to take all steps necessary to see to it that Scott and Kimberly McDonald are arrested for this crime. You, you ruined it. You ruined everything. You ruined it. Hey, buddy. Congratulations. Thanks, Jeff. Good job, man. Congratulations. Thanks, Paul. Take care. Yeah. Ken, I'm really sorry. Get it, Bella. Sorry. I'll see you in class. Yeah. Well, I'd like to do more. But all I can say is thank you. It's in a... Where's Amy? Well, earlier she said she was going to go pick up her $250,000 bail money and uh, leave town. That's what you've been telling her to do. Congratulations. Yeah. I guess so. You guess? She was totally irresponsible, recklessly unpredictable. And if you don't go after her this second, I'll personally see to it that you never, ever practice law. Not one word. Amy! Wait! What is it? I know. You just want to make sure that I'm absolutely leaving town. That I'm gone, out of your life forever. Well, don't worry. I I have your first-class ticket to Tahiti, which should make you overjoyed. Are you finished? Because I came down here to tell you I... <sighs> Thank you. You're welcome. Wait. And also, that... What? <laughs> what? That running away from me was the biggest mistake you ever made. And that you'll do anything. Anything to get me back. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Now, are you happy? Of course. It's just that a woman likes to hear these things from the man she adores. And why are you driving away from me? This is my third time around the block. Three times. No. As always, I'll get you the first time around.
the jet around seven. Where are you going? New York. Is there anything I can help you with? I don't think so. Okay, who's up first? You're seeing Spencer and his attorney at two o'clock, then Kathy Grant and her attorney. I hope we can avoid any more losses. It's a public relations nightmare. Yeah, I just hope I can get some of my money back from that one. Well, leave him alone. Brown! Hey, Brown! Up here! Take it easy on him, okay? As if he were my own son. Wanna bet he doesn't make it up the stairs? You're lazy, Brown. Your days are numbered, kid. Yes, sir. How you doing, Brown? Feeling okay? Never better. Yeah, well, I'm glad to hear it. A couple of these expansion teams have been calling about you. you. Got some crazy idea that I might want to trade you just because you blew a few games for us. Hey, anybody can have a slump. Excuse me, I, I'm sorry. Uh, what'd you say? I said anybody can have a slump. <laughs> That's exactly what I said. And I told him, just watch how well he's going to play for the rest of the season. So if you hear any rumors about being traded, don't believe it. You're part of the family. Very yeah, like you, I suppose, huh? Well, let me tell you something, kiddo. It's about time you learn how to handle people, okay? That's that subtle enough for you? You know, Spencer could become a real problem unless we can come up with a settlement. Why are you so worried about this hockey player? He's probably one of the most popular stars we ever had, that's all. Eh, all fans think that professional athletes are greedy and overpaid, but they also have a short memory. Well, Spencer doesn't. He remembers all the promises you made. He's got nothing on paper. All he's got is a bad temper. No, I was with you when you told Spencer you'd take care of him. Now, that's very interesting. Read my lips, because I'm only going to say it once. I was alone. Get it? Kathy! Ha <laughs> oh, you're looking wonderful. How are you? Thatcher, this is my attorney, Wendell Parker. Mr. Horton. Any objections if I um, have a private moment with your client? None, if she doesn't. What the hell do you think you're doing? Just asking for what's coming to me. Oh, why didn't you come to me? Why drag a lawyer in? What's the matter? Don't you trust me? Absolutely not. I see. Well, my dear, if my memory serves me correctly, I think it was you who deceived me. That's low, Thatcher. Yes, but is it low enough? You gotta promise me. I promise. I won't take his arm off at the socket. I won't even break his nose. You sure you want me to do this? Yes, I'm sure. Bobby, I don't negotiate contracts. It's not what I do. I should have some high-powered attorney for this. Look, I've been through these guys before. They took me for every penny, and it didn't turn out any better. You I trust. Okay, then. Here's the deal. The only way I can negotiate with Horton is to make him think that I can roast him in front of a jury. But if he thinks even for a second that his attorney can make you nuts... Looking at Mr. Sub-Zero. Today is not just practice. So be prepared. I'll do everything to provoke you. I know a little about delivering under pressure. Two playoffs in the championship finals. I remember. Yeah, you do. It's just the entire sports world has forgotten. I bet he knows how I feel. A couple of more off games, Horton will trade him. Fame. How fast it all goes away. Come on. Let's show him you still got it. Bobby. How's it going? Yeah, hey, things are great. How are you? Ooh, terrific. <laughs> Well, I almost as well as you do. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, this is Ken Malansky, my lawyer. Kathy Grant, tennis superstar. Hey, I'm a fan. Never forget that time you beat Martina on that tiebreaker in Paris. Neither will I. <laughs> well, we're due upstairs. Okay. Give him hell. Hey, you too. Now, Mr. Horton, let me go over a few things about depositions so we won't have any misunderstandings. Young man. I have been deposed more times than you're likely to do the job in your entire career. Uh, I know I'm under oath, so why don't you just go at me best you can. Give it both barrels, okay? Right. 
Mr. Horton, are you the owner of a hockey team known as... Let me as help you out here. Look, I own this arena and the teams that go with it. Um, I employed your client as a player on my hockey team, and one year he even started. Turning your attention to the playing season a few uh, years sorry, ago... Excuse me just a minute. Thank you, dear. Sorry about this. <laughs> Doctor's orders. Oh. Okay, now, um... Where were we? Was that the year that my client not only started, but was team captain? Two seasons ago, uh, yes, he was. And did he injure his right knee in the last game of the regular season before the playoffs? Yes, he did. <clears throat> Terrible thing. And did the doctor tell you he ran the risk of permanent injury if he played again before having surgery on the knee? Well, now, I believe there were several medical opinions. That could have been one of them. Lord knows I paid enough doctor bills for your boy there. <laughs> Sir... Just answer my questions. Sorry. Didn't you come to my client and ask him to lead the team in the playoffs? I did not. Didn't you tell him that the only chance the team had of winning the Stanley Cup was if he played? No, as a matter of fact, I had two players ready in his position who were just as good. Some say even better. Now, don't give me that look, Bobby. You know as well as I do. You started the year hot as a pistol, but the last third you kind of fell apart. Who are you going to replace me with, huh? Rogers? At my worst, I'll skate him off the ice. Isn't it a fact that you promised my client that if he played and was injured, you'd take care of him? It is not. Isn't it a fact that you promised him a job in management that would be equal to the balance of his contract? No way. Come on, Counselor. My entire front office doesn't make as much as I was paying him. Isn't it a fact that you Son, even... the fact is, you're a boy here, and I mean no disrespect to somebody who has been a good player. The truth is, your boy here has some big expenses. I mean, he got a little greedy. Women, fast cars, some say cocaine. Hey, that is a lie. Let's go off the record, please. I did not personally believe it, but like I said, he had a lot of expenses. Sure, he wanted to play. Hell, he needed money. Hey, what I wanted was a championship. Stop it, Bobby. Took a chance, and he lost. Too bad, I'm sorry, but that's the way it goes. Got in the fast lane, you couldn't handle it. You got greedy, kid. That's pathetic, but you're washed up. Hey, you son of a... Bobby, get off. I'm fine. That's enough for today. We'll reschedule this deposition at a Bob time when... counselor. This deposition is finished now. So is your client, so why don't you just leave? Hmm? So stop it! Who the hell does he think he is? He is lying! That's enough! No, it is not enough! Not for him! I'll tear his head off! Maybe then he'll tell the truth! You were on your way to New York. What happened? Uh, we had a little equipment failure on the plane. They're working on it now. I'll just fly out again in the morning. So, uh, tonight I'm yours. Can I ask you something? Sure. You hear me when I came in just now? Mm-hmm. Could have been anybody. You seem pretty relaxed. 
You should know by now, but not much frightens me. Maybe you were expecting somebody? <laughs> Would you care? I might. Darling, you know that I'm as true to you as you are to me. Yes, I'm sure you are. much better idea. Why don't you join me? I might just do that. You might just join me or you might just break my neck. Don't go away. I'll be right back. I need to leave a message. Oh, please. Good morning, Mr. Malansky. May I assume you're down here looking for work? I'm Robert Spencer's attorney. What are you holding them on? I do believe you have your work cut out for you. Why? Thatcher Horton was found shot to death at his home last night. Horton? We found the gun in your client's car. And here the poor boy just can't seem to remember where he was. And there's another thing. Eric, would you be kind enough to pass me that lab report, please, sir? The lab confirms that gun was the same gun that was used to kill Thatcher Horton. We are now charging your client with the crime of murder. Would you give me a few minutes with my client, please? Ken, I didn't kill anyone. What happened? I don't remember. But the last thing I remember, I was in this bar... Don't ask me which one. I wake up this morning, the cops are pounding on my door. Have a I don't know. I mean, they're all over the place. And then one of them comes in and says he found a gun that had recently been fired. Was it your gun? I don't have a gun. What I have is a splitting headache. Can you get me out of here? Harry? Yes. You haven't touched your breakfast. I'm reading a brief. Your eggs will get cold. Oh, I finally have all the plans for the fishing trip. I thought the fishing trip was canceled. Judge Blaine and I have arranged everything. He and Mr. Higgins are going to meet in San Francisco day after tomorrow. And then you're all going to Vancouver. 
Two weeks of fishing with a judge who's never ruled for me and a lawyer who can only talk about his fees. Perry, you need a vacation. I've had a vacation. (laughs) Too late to change your mind. Mason. We go before the judge tomorrow morning. Now, if we can get you out on bail... Wait, wait, wait. If? Ken, you got to get me out of here. It's not quite that simple, Mr. Spencer. Don't forget you've been charged with murder. Yeah, but I didn't do it. I'm innocent. Besides, I can't actually prove I did do it. What about the gun? Any idea how it got in your car? Look, I already told Ken I don't remember how I got home, even where I was. And your threat of violence against Mr. Horton. Listen, if they put away everybody who hated Horton, there wouldn't be enough jails to hold them. Hey, whose side are you on anyway? I'm looking at the prosecution's case. Motive, opportunity, murder weapon. I've seen men convicted on less. Yeah, well, then why are you wasting your time talking to me? Besides, I don't have the money to pay a big-time lawyer. I'm not your lawyer. I'm only here as a favor to Ken. Oh, this is a favor? You come down here and tell me I'm definitely going to prison? Hey, idiot. Man, you obviously don't believe me. I mean, you think I'm a liar, maybe even a killer. Man, why don't you take a walk? Good idea. Brilliant. What? What? You're really worried about Bobby's chances, aren't you? The evidence against him is substantial. Yes, you. I felt better about that, too. Oh, Ken, he can't be in better hands. Uh, I don't know, Amy. Besides, you have me. And I'm not referring to the fact that we've now been engaged five months, three weeks, and two days. I meant that professionally. What's that supposed to mean? Well, I'm sure you've noticed that it's been weeks. Well, months, actually, since I've asked to be involved in your work. I have noticed and been grateful. But why do I think that's about to end? Before you develop an unfortunate attitude, well, there are a few things I think you should be aware of. Like what? Well, like for the past few months, I've been enrolled in the university's police science program. You what? Investigative techniques, criminalistics, procedures... I think I'm really ready to help you, Ken. Uh, Amy. Ken, I don't want to be a dilettante all my life. I want to do something constructive. And I've been working really hard to prepare myself so that we can be a team. I was hoping that you'd be pleased. <laughs> I am pleased. And proud and impressed. But this is a murder trial. So? So I'm not sure that I'm even up to it. Much no. less me. Well... Ken, you really don't have any confidence in me, do you? I never said that. You don't have to. Amy, try to understand. Oh, I understand. You're worried about this case. And since it's a serious case, you don't want me underfoot. That's not what I'm worried about. Oh, well, what are you worried about? I was wrong to represent Bobby Spencer at the deposition. And a murder trial is worse. It's out of the question. I'm too close to this guy. (sighs) Can you go back to Perry? I doubt it. Well, if you change your mind, he's giving another lecture at the police science department tomorrow. I know, because I'm going. Good night. Amy, the door's locked. You see, with your keen deductive powers, you certainly don't need me. I'm really sorry about that. Bob's not really like that. Dan, just... you've got some real problems right. with your case. The main one is your client. I know, and I know I'm asking a lot. Ken, I need more than advice. I need you on the case. Everybody has a first murder trial. This case needs you, not someone first time out. Now, before you make any snap judgments about Bob, let me just tell you this. He and I practically grew up together. 
He's from a very poor family, and his father deserted him when he was 10, and he's been supporting a bunch of them ever since. When he lost his income from hockey, it wasn't just him that was hurt. It was seven other people who depend on him for their livelihood. Robert Spencer is innocent. He couldn't commit this crime. How much of that would have been your opening remarks in the civil suit? Well, I... First part. Very effective. Especially the part about the seven people. However, I'd specify who they were, give them names so the jury sees them as real people, not just numbers. On the whole, not bad. When we were in law school, you told us never to get personally involved with our clients. Well, I can't help it. I'm too close to this. He's my friend. I know he made a lousy impression on you, and I haven't got a right to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Please take the case. If you can't do it for him, then do it out of friendship for me. You want me to break my own rule? Take the case for a friend? Well, let me tell you. When we get to court, if there's a summation, it's all yours. Judge, $250,000 bail. How'd you swing the money, by the way? I didn't. Mr. Mason did. Oh. Uh, about the bail, thank you. Listen, uh, I may have been a little rough on you yesterday. I just want you to know that it wasn't personal. Neither is what I'm going to tell you. I got you out on bail because Ken asked me to. I also like having my clients looking healthy and fit and confident when they walk into court. So I booked you into a room here. I don't want you to leave this hotel. There's a great health club downstairs and I hope you use it. Under no circumstances are you to have alcohol, visitors, or talk to the press. Is that clear? Well, maybe I should just go back to jail. Maybe you should. Any questions? Yeah. Who's paying your fee? No fee. Every decade or so, I take on a client like you just for the hell of it. There's his key. All right. Who would you pick to have framed Spencer? Probably someone who saw him threaten Horton earlier in the day. And who might that be? People in the waiting room. Kathy Grant. The tennis star? Horton's son, Stuart, and somebody else, Temple Brown. The basketball player. You really think one of them could have been the murderer? Well, it's certainly possible. But which of them had a motive? All right, I'm going to check around inside, and you... And I'll check around outside. Well, Mrs. Horton, outside of a bit of black, very few mortals would realize the depth of your grief. Coffee? No, thank you. You know, if I were to tell you that my husband and I had a marriage based on love, you'd know that I was lying. Thatcher and I, however, were friendly, if not true friends. How's that for honesty? Refreshing, as far as it goes. I hope that means I'm a suspect. I have always wanted to be considered capable of murder. As long as I was innocent, of course. I'll be sure to make a note of that. Now, just before you married your late husband, there were great rumors about a prenuptial agreement. I'm sure you'll find out they were more than just rumors. I remember them so well. The agreement provided that I get half a million dollars a year for three years 
If my husband divorced me, nothing if I divorced him. And they say they repealed the Fugitive Slave Act. They also say he had a new girlfriend. <laughs> he always had a new girlfriend. This one was supposed to be serious. Relatively speaking, Thatcher strayed. He was not stolen. Now, if there's nothing else... No, no. Nothing at the moment. However, I'm sure we'll meet again. Amy! Of course. What are you doing here? What am I doing here? What, what are you doing here? Is it obvious? Working. And thank goodness I already photographed where the killer landed before you completely Working decimated... on my case? Oh, is this your case? When I was hired as Della's assistant, all I knew was that some young green lawyer was going to help me. Amy, you. you went to Perry Mason behind my back. To be more precise, I went to Della Street and proposed an entry-level position for myself. You know point, exactly what I mean. Amy, you finished? Quite. Well, I see you've met Della's new assistant. Yeah. Let's uh, take a look at all of this. Ken, would you go to where the killer was? You can stay on this side of the wall. Now, I'm in the spot the police marked as the place Horton was standing when he was shot. Ken, how far apart are we? About 20 feet. At least 20 yards. All's forgiven. You can come back now. Horton had just gotten himself a drink. He was probably moving around. Like that? He was shot three times in a pattern no larger than two inches by a killer 20 yards away shooting through curtains. The killer was a hired gun. Yeah, the average person about to commit a crime of passion would have their heart pounding, their hands shaky, and they... Well, according to everything I've read, anyway. Expertly planned and executed. Only a professional could have done it. Any of our suspects could have hired the killer. Even if they had an alibi at the time of the murder, they could still be guilty. Top marks to both of you. As long as that first row of seats is 30 feet from the baseline, it should be okay. Let's go look. Hello oh, again? Ken Lansky. Sure, Bobby's attorney. Could I talk to you for a few minutes? Of course. I'll meet you downstairs, okay? You know, I don't think for a second that Bobby did it. I'll tell you anything I can to help him out. Thank you. Uh, how well do you know Thatcher Horton? We were in a business deal together, organizing a women's celebrity pro tennis tour. <laughs> Whatever happened to that? I remember reading all the advanced publicity and then suddenly it was canceled. Well, he said he couldn't do it. But you quit the pro circuit in order to go into business with him. I felt I was beginning to burn out. It seemed like a good opportunity. Your contract with Mr. Horton required that you render exclusive services in exchange for very little money. You were giving up the possibility of millions on the pro tour. I would have been part owner and I would have made it up on the back end. Look, I thought you wanted me to help you with Bobby. Why these questions? It's my job to see who might have had reason to kill Thatcher Horton. How I may have felt about Thatcher Horton wouldn't have made any difference. I was busy taping a late night talk show when he was shot. About uh, 300 people saw me. Satisfied? It's possible that the killer was a hired gun. What's that got to do with me? Didn't you threaten him with a lawsuit over the collapse of your business partnership? He was going to settle with me. What made you think he'd treat you any differently than anybody else? He would have settled with me. Excuse me. 
I'm looking for Stuart Horton. I haven't seen anybody. I just work on plants. Well, that's certainly a healthy bromeliad. What's your secret? No secret. I change the soil. That's interesting. This particular orchid doesn't grow in soil. Oh, really? Well, I'll keep that in mind. Yes. Keep that in mind. Mr. Mason. Yes? Mr. Horton's running a little late. I'll wait. Pain, frustration, and disappointment. It's not religion or politics, it's money. Take a look at this. Too bad we can't cash in. Offering $50,000 for information about who shot Thatcher Horton. I thought they caught the guy who did it. Maybe they caught the wrong guy. You know anyone selling hot guns? Charlie, you're not doing a little business on the side, are you? <laughs> I got a workout. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Looks like a moment to divide and conquer. You take Temple Brown. Right. Only authorized personnel in here. I'm Robert Spencer's attorney. Yeah? So? So I talked to the bartender at one of the clubs Spencer visited the night of the murder. Says you were there and that you bought my client a drink. Yeah, so you say. Look, we can do this one of two ways. You can talk to me now or in court. I don't much care which. Your choice. My choice, huh? Well, my choice is to get on with my workout. If you want to talk, you keep up. Sorry about your father. If you don't mind, I have a few questions. Well, of course. Were you and he very close? Well, my mother died when I was 15, and after that, all my father and I had was each other. Thanks, Danny. But he sent you away to school. Yes, that's right, military boarding school. Which was very good for me. Taught me discipline for the first time, then college. But we spent every summer and all my vacations together. <laughs> Sounds like a great life. Mr. Mason, my father was a difficult man. It wasn't easy being his son. How about being his employee? Worse. No longer a problem, is it? All his wealth, position, and power are yours now. Eventually, it would have been mine anyway. He was grooming me to take over paint a very different picture than the one I've gotten. I was told your father paid you no more than a secretary, gave you no authority. And from his memos, I gathered he knew for certain you were afraid to leave your job or afraid to stay. Well, I know one thing for certain, Mr. Mason. I'm not afraid of you. Spencer's guilty. He's going to pay for it. I saw him at the club. I even bought him a drink. Feel sorry for the fool. The fool? Trusting Horton. Even if he says what he claims he did, the man's word wasn't worth spit. What time did you see my client that night? More or less. It's hard to say. I was with a lot of people. Last thing I wanted to talk about was that old man. Sounds like you didn't like Horton much. My father was a real hard dude, but smart. 
You almost had to respect you. What about the son? I saw you with him today. What was that all about? The son's stupid. Thinks the way to get me to play better is to threaten to trade me to an expansion team. I've been your best year. Well, cold in the clutch a couple of times. That happens to everybody. It's not what the sports writers are saying. They're really sticking it to you. Yeah. I'd like to see one of them put it in. 17,000 people screaming at you. 22 feet out. One second on the clock. somewhere high school some in college yeah you almost good <laughs> these are plastered all over the arena oh the bailiff at court had one I've been passing them out. I have six high school kids helping. $50,000 reward for information revealing seller or purchaser of Thatcher Horton murder gun. 357 Desert Eagle automatic. Serial numbers filed. Cracked handle and silencer. Straightforward, not too dramatic. Also, $100,000 for information leading to the identity of the true killer. An incentive program. I want it to appeal to the truly greedy as well as the borderline weasel. It's incredible. Thank you. I don't think that's what Ken had in mind. Uh, honey, what you've done is... Extremely dangerous. You could be hurt. But it's so practical. Amy... A lot of people will read this. You even left your home phone number. Of course. I didn't want Della bothered with all those calls. I didn't leave my home address. Besides, who would hurt me? The killer. Oh. So, what are we going to do? Well, she'll have to stay close to you. I'm afraid you'll have to put aside whatever disagreements you have, at least for the moment. I'll stay close, but I'd rather not. I'll stay close to her. But I'd rather not either. So would you wait a minute, Amy? Charlie left here about an hour ago. Just ran out the door. Where? Not a clue. Except that she was real excited. Like winning the lottery or something. Money. Lots of money. Like falling from the sky. I mean, one minute she was reading that flyer, the next minute she was gone. You know, she must know something about that Thatcher Horton murder. Hey, if Charlie gets that cash, you tell him that Al's entitled to a half of it. <laughs> I was the one that gave him the flyer. <laughs> Mr. Mason. Oh, Mr. Spencer, Della Street. We've spoken on the phone. I can't get so much as a beer in this hotel. I told you no alcohol. I don't like being treated like a child. If, when this is over, you are a free man, you can have a thousand drinks of anything you like. Until then, try iced tea. I just got your message, dear. Yeah, I was looking for Ken. Do you know where he is? He was supposed to be with you. 
Oh, no, no, I'm fine. Don't worry about me. Listen, um, if he comes back to the hotel, you tell him I got a message on my answering machine. Some woman named Charlie wants to meet at 5.30. She says she sold this killer the gun. Someone's at the door. I gotta go. Bye. Sorry. Nice watch. Listen, what I'm interested in is a 357 Desert Eagle with filed off serial numbers and a cracked handle. Sold one like that last week. How about letting me in? Uh, no, we can talk here. Uh, can you tell me about it? People don't give their names. Well, can you describe them? Not really. Look, what I expected was the name or at least a description of the buyer. That's why there's a reward. Listen, why don't we go out for a drink, some dinner? Maybe my memory will come back. Uh, I don't think so. I have plans with my fiance. All right. Again. She's late. She said 5.30. You're sure this is the right place? Yes. I think so. Who's that? Charlie? Are you Amy? We were worried you wouldn't show. Young lady, we need to talk to you. Yeah, and I need you like I need a funeral. Charlie, a man's life could depend upon your testimony. We really yeah, well, my life depends on getting out of town. You blew it. I'm out of here. Well, we did blow it. Five minutes to make coffee. Oh, thanks. Just one cup. You don't have to feel compromised. I won't seduce you. Look, I really can't stay. Ken? Someone took the tape from my answering machine. That's how the man knew about the meeting with Charlie. Who was in the house? No one. I didn't let anyone in. Amy, that means somebody broke in. Oh, God. The man who came to see me today. Maybe he's the killer. And I let him get away. Oh, Ken. I made such a mess of this. I'm a failure as a detective. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Look, we, we wouldn't have gotten this close without you. And don't forget, you can identify him if we see him again. That could be very important. Think so? Absolutely. I mean, it would 
would have been so easy for you to tell me that this is a perfect example of why I shouldn't be involved in this at all. But, yeah, well, but you didn't. You stood by me when I needed you. Ken, you've given me the strength to go on. I have? Definitely. All I need is a good night's rest, and, well, tomorrow's another day. You don't learn, do you? What do you mean? Well, what I mean is you almost got the three of us killed today, and you're ready to start up again tomorrow, so nothing happened. I think I liked you better when I was weak and vulnerable. Well, I don't think we should discuss this tonight. Yes, if I were you, I'd leave while I was ahead. Come on. What are you doing? You're not staying here. A man broke into this house. It's not safe. You're staying with me. Now, come on. Well, when you put it like that, what can I say? I thought you said you wouldn't seduce me. I have to pick up some of Dad's papers from his study. see you every day, but I just couldn't take the chance for your sake. For my sake? Sweetheart, I don't blame you, but if people found wait out Wait a minute, wait a minute. You think that I killed him? Honey, I can't blame you. I should hope not. I assume that you did it. Me? Oh, oh my, look at your face. I can't believe how well you lie. I'm going to have to reconsider a couple of things you have told me with so much conviction. I hope I'm not interrupting family business. Actually, we were just talking about the murder. Anything new on the investigation? Yes, that's uh, why I'm here. More questions, Mr. Horton? I'll be in my father's office if you need me. All right, ask away. I just hope this theory is a little more interesting than your last theory. I think it will hold your interest. The phone call to your stepson on the night of the murder. Phone call? The records from the phone company say it took place almost at the time of the shooting. We know that because the call to the police was less than two minutes later. Is this leading somewhere? Yes. You're telling me who placed the call? Well, let me see. I was in the bathtub when the shooting happened. So apparently my husband called his son. I would guess to tell him that he wasn't going to New York after all. Wouldn't you think? The operator at your stepson's answering service remembers hearing a woman's voice. Mr. Mason, don't you know anything? An answering service has two real functions. One is to put you on hold, and the other is to write down your message incorrectly. Will there be anything else? I wouldn't be at all surprised. You look very comfortable in your father's chair. I am. What can I do for you, Mr. Mason? I was wondering why your stepmother called you the night of the murder. Well, you already asked Linda that question, didn't you? Now I'm asking you. Why? To see if we say the same thing? That's part of it. Well, why would you care what Linda and I discussed? I want to know who hired the killer that murdered your father, that's all. I'd suggest you and Linda get your story straight before the trial.
The band was silver with these big chunks of turquoise on it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know the one you mean. It had one with either a man or a woman's watch set into it. Have you sold many of them? Mm, well, four, five. Four or five in the last couple of months. By any chance did you sell one to a man about 35, receding hairline, long sideburns, and really piercing blue eyes about mm, this tall? Blue eyes. Yes, you know, I think I do remember selling one to someone like that. Why? He lost it in the bar where I work. He seemed like a good guy, and the watch looked like it cost a fortune. Mm -hmm. It did. <laughs> do you have it? No. No, my boss has it. And he won't return it until somebody claims it. If you could just give me the guy's name. Oh, no, I don't think I should do that. <sighs> Miss, this is the four store I've tried. I'm tired and I'm not going to argue with you. If you don't give me the name, as far as I'm concerned, my boss can just keep okay, watching. Okay, 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 okay. Let me see if I've got the credit card slip. What in the world? You think that makes any difference? You think the cops are really going to care about that? Terrific.
Tell him, how many times have we done this? Every time is like the first time for me. Well, Adela, Mr. Mason. Don't you look handsome. We're doing court in a half an hour. I doubt they'll start without us. There's something I want to say before we start. Just so it's not a confession. Well, it is sort of, sort of an apology. I know I've been kind of a jerk. I'll sort of accept your apology. Look, I, I've, I've always had a temper. I, maybe, maybe that's why I was so good at hockey in the beginning. I was sure it wasn't brains. I, hell, I'd never even gotten through college on my own. Ken pulled me through. He's a good friend. Probably better than I deserve. Look, the only thing I've ever been able to do really well is hockey. When I got hurt, and all of a sudden I lost that, I hated everybody, because I, uh, well, I felt like I didn't have anything left. That's, that's why I acted the way I did. I see. I mean, at first, I, I didn't even care whether I won or lost the case. No. Now I, well, I appreciate all you've done, all you're doing. I wanted you to know that before we start. And I want to win. Well, let's do exactly that. Tell me, Lieutenant, after the arresting officers found People's Exhibit A under the seat in the defendant's car, what was done with it? I sent it up to the lab for a ballistics check. And what did you find? We found that we had a perfect match. That gun was positively identified as the one that was used to shoot and to kill Thatcher Horton. Thank you, Lieutenant. No further questions at this time, Your Honor. I do reserve the right to recall. Mr. Mason. Yes, Your Honor. I always have questions of Lieutenant Brock. Lieutenant Brock, how many times was the deceased shot? Three times, Mr. Mason. How close were the entry points of the bullets? Here's the coroner's report for your recollection. Uh, just a moment. Mr. Molansky, with the court's permission? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Molansky will be standing at the same distance Thatcher Horton was from the killer, assuming you to be the killer. Now, Lieutenant, I ask you once again, how close were the three entry points? The three shots came all within a diameter of two inches, Mr. Mason. About the size of a silver dollar. Quite a shot. You're a trained marksman, Lieutenant. Could you do that? Not on my best day, Mr. Mason. Shots would have to be almost simultaneous, wouldn't they? Otherwise, if the victim moved, turned, or fell, the target area would change. That is correct. Could you get off three rounds that quickly, Lieutenant? Well, probably not, but Mr. Mason, I'm not a professional athlete. I don't have the defendant's hands, I don't have his eyes, or I don't have his reflexes, sir. Very well, Lieutenant. You just mentioned the defendant's physical capabilities. Dr. McLeod, would you please stand? Dr. McLeod has been attending Robert Spencer for several years. He's prepared to testify that two years ago, the defendant injured his right hand. It then became arthritic, leaving his trigger finger with limited mobility. Uh, thank you, doctor. If that is true, how could Robert Spencer fire quickly enough to hit that target as it moved? Objection. Speculation. Your Honor, the lieutenant has investigated, what, dozens of shootings? Well, no, I'd say more, 
closer to 100, Mr. Mason. I suggest he more than qualifies as an expert. I'll allow it. Thank you. Now, Lieutenant, in your expert opinion, could a marksman with an arthritic condition and impaired mobility to his trigger finger have fired those three shots quickly enough to have hit that target as it moved? Probably not, Mr. Mason. Well, Lieutenant, if he couldn't hit the target, he couldn't kill the target. No further questions. Redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Lieutenant, is there any reason the accused couldn't have fired with his left hand? Objection calls for speculation. I'll allow it. Fair is fair, Mr. Mason. He could have, the defendant could have used his left hand. What about accuracy? Well, there again, at the distance in question, it would depend on how steady the hand, how good the eyes. Now, if a good athlete was motivated, he very easily could have done it. All hypothetically speaking, of course. No more questions, Your Honor. Mr. Mason, recross? Uh, no recross, Your Honor. You may step down, Lieutenant Brock. Ms. August? The people rest, Your Honor. Lieutenant. Nice dollar. Mr. Mason, is the defense prepared to call his first witness? Yes, Your Honor. Defense calls Kathy Grant. Miss Grant, would you please tell the court how well you knew the deceased? We were business associates. We were attempting to put together a women's tennis project. The project was scrapped, was it not? Yes, it was. We have information that Thatcher Horton was planning to get married again. Can you tell us to whom? How would I know? Because you were involved in his plans. Now, Thatcher Horton planned to get married again. So I ask you again, would you tell us to whom? All right, well, he did ask me to marry him, but I didn't take him seriously. But Mr. Horton was certainly a serious man, was he not? He spoke to his lawyers about divorcing his wife, did he not? Yes, well, he told me he did. He also mentioned naming me in a new will. A new will? Hmm. Then suddenly he broke things off. Then, within weeks, your business partnership with him collapsed. All that is true, is it not? No. No, that's not true. Isn't it true that you were personally and professionally betrayed by him? Isn't it true that when you demanded he compensate you, he refused? I learned the hard way what Thatcher was really like, but I didn't kill him. As a matter of fact, he didn't break it off with me. I told him I wouldn't marry him. Wouldn't marry him or couldn't marry him? Couldn't marry him. One of the wealthiest men in the country, the single most powerful man in sports. Now, what could you possibly say in the way of rejection? I had told him I was already married. I married a boy who was in the Air Force when I was 16. We didn't tell anyone because I was so young. He got his wings about the same time I turned pro. One day he was on a routine mission. There was an accident. He lost both of his legs. He told me I could go out and date. We could get a divorce. When Thatcher asked me to marry him, I thought about it, but I couldn't go through with it. I couldn't get a divorce. I knew it would kill him. I couldn't do that. I'm very sorry. 
No further questions. The witness is excused. This being the hour for our lunch recess, court will adjourn until one o'clock. State your name for the record, please. Linda Horton. Mrs. Horton, you are the widow of the deceased? I am. We were married for nearly five years. And would you describe your marriage as a happy one? I would describe it as successful. You just heard Kathy Grant testify that your husband asked her to marry him. How does that square with your definition of a successful marriage? I know nothing about that. You had no indication? None. No intuition? None. Absolutely. Mrs. Horton, I find it difficult to believe a bright, sensitive woman like yourself had no idea her husband was about to divorce her. Mr. Mason, my husband was notorious for his liaisons. In my experience, he took them to bed, not to the altar. Uh, Your Honor, may I have a moment? Yes, Mr. Mason. Now, you say you didn't know your husband was about to divorce you. But you do know about your husband's will. I have a copy of it right here. Just obtained from the clerk's office. I'd like to have it marked as defendants next in order. Without objection, so order. This document makes you equal with your husband's son, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Approximately, what would that share be worth? I couldn't say. Come now, in round numbers, in excess of $100 million? I suppose so. But if your husband left you, if not for Kathy Grant, then for another woman, your prenuptial agreement would provide you with $500,000 a year for three years, but you would inherit nothing. I suppose. Wouldn't you also suppose that you're much better off with your husband dead than alive? At least a hundred million dollars better off? Objection. Speculation, argumentative, and harassing the witness. I really would like to answer that, if you don't mind. The court will allow it. I had an intuition you might bring this up. So, I came prepared. This is a copy of the most recent will that my husband drew. His lawyer will file that for probate today. He gave me that several weeks ago. You'll notice that his son, Stuart, gets everything. I inherit nothing. For which you have my deepest condolences. I would imagine your grief would only be eased by another marriage. This one, perhaps to your stepson. Objection. Sustained. I have no more questions of this witness.
Hello? Amy, do you have any idea what time it is? Where the hell are you? What? He's in that room over there. That's your find him? It was easy. How easy? Well, first of all, I assumed he was still in town since you'd heard him demanding a payoff. I didn't think he'd leave until he got it, which could take some time. So far, I'm with you. The only thing I knew for certain was that he wouldn't go back to the warehouse. So I deduced that since he was in hiding, he wouldn't have access to his own phone. So you decided to stake out every payphone in town? I staked out the phone he was using. That one. How'd you find it? Through the phone company. I thought he might be using a credit card. Turns out I was right. My motherly type at the local branch helped me out after I sort of explained to her that there he is. Let's go, Sherlock. You say the sweetest things. Don't tell anybody. somebody to pick up the money Horton son it's gotta be call the cops Getting any information from that one. 
Interesting that the hitman had a key to the arena itself, but not to the executive offices. Well, sir, that's probably because there are more arena keys floating around, in which case that would make them easier to steal. But when he gets inside, it's not to meet anyone. He wanted something from Stuart Horton's office. I wonder what he was after. That we will never know. Good night, all. I know people who would call that withholding evidence. He dropped it before he was shot. Why don't you tell the good lieutenant we'd like to study it for a couple of hours? Great. I'll order some coffee. Very hot. Very black. <laughs> really think that this could be the answer? At this point, it had better be. Your Honor, I'd like to place this item in evidence as defense exhibit number seven. May I see it, Mr. Mason? Mr. Mason. Yes, Your Honor, I call Stuart Horton to the stand. Mr. Horton. You are the only child and sole heir of the deceased, are you not? I am, but I didn't know anything about that new will until yesterday when my stepmother took it from her purse. I see. You uh, worked for your father, did you not? I was vice president of his company. Large title, modest paycheck. Well, I was being trained to take over. But with that modest paycheck, you support a penthouse here in town? Yes. A ski house in Aspen? Beach house in California? That's true. Objection. Even for one of Mr. Mason's great fishing expeditions, we seem to be on a rather long line of irrelevancy here. Mr. Mason, I agree with the prosecution. I'm about to connect up, Your Honor. Quickly, Mr. Mason. How do you manage to live so well on so little, Mr. Horton? I inherited quite a lot of money from my mother. But you gambled that away, did you not? In fact, there was quite an unpleasant moment with your father over your betting on sports, was there not? He told me to stop, and I did. <clears throat> your Honor... I would like the clerk to show Mr. Horton defense exhibit number seven. Certainly, Miss Jackson. Now, Mr. Horton, would you examine that notebook, please, and tell me if you recognize it? I don't. You don't recognize it? No. Even if I told you the man who was shot last night in your sports arena, took it from the desk in your office? I've never seen it before. That brings me to my last order of business with you, Mr. Horton. I'm going to ask you about your relationship with your stepmother. Is it not true that you and your stepmother are lovers? Yes. I can't hear you. You're lovers. You hated your father, did you not? Yes. You hated him so much, you felt so humiliated by him, that you made love to his wife in his own house. Yes. I made love to her. Yes, I hated him. But I didn't kill him. I didn't kill him. I have no further questions. But I reserve the right to recall this witness, Your Honor. No questions, Your Honor. You may step down, Mr. Horton. Mr. Mason. I call Temple Brown. Mr. Brown. You're a member of Mr. Horton's basketball team, are you not? 
That's right. Two years ago, you were even voted onto the all-star team, weren't you? I was one of the top scorers in the league. One of the all-time greats. Now, would you please examine this notebook? Never seen it. Suppose I told you that the man who stole that book from Stuart Horton's desk was a hired killer. The same hired killer who shot and killed Thatcher Horton. I don't know. That's just a notebook with some scribbles in it. But very interesting scribbles. Would you please read the top line? Boston by at least four, fifty thousand dollars. Would you identify this bank statement for the record? It's mine. Marked as defendants next in order. Now, what is that deposit there? Fifty thousand dollars. Fifty thousand dollars made the day after your team lost to Boston. Suppose I told you I could match up at least 25 games last year with point spreads listed in this book and deposits in several of your accounts. I don't know. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown, I am sorry. Sorry about you. You're a cheat. You threw games, shaved points, you broke faith with your teammates, you broke faith with your friends and loved ones, but most of all, with the fans who believed in you, all for money. You made plenty, you wanted more. Maybe, maybe I did, but that's no reason to kill old man Horton. Exactly. No reason to kill Thatcher Horton. Every reason to kill his son, Stuart. That's crazy. Mr. Brown, what would happen to a professional basketball player found betting on games? Suspension. For how long? I don't know. Maybe a year, maybe life. If I don't miss my guess, Stuart Horton found out you were betting on basketball games. He threatened you with a suspension. He then got you to shave points. After that, there was just no turning back. Are you making this up as you go along? Objection. Speculation. Mr. Mason is fishing again. I tend to agree with the counselor. You do seem to be fishing, Mr. Mason. Uh, Your Honor, uh, counselor, uh, I'll tie this up in a minute. Very well, you may proceed, Mr. Mason. Objection overruled. Now, Mr. Brown, you hired that hitman to kill Stuart Horton, did you not? The killer shadowed him until he knew his habits, waiting for the right moment. Do you know what he found? I don't know anything. He found out every time the father left town. The son came over and slept with his wife. And that was the moment he picked for the kill. That's not true, none of it. The father came home unexpectedly, but the killer couldn't know that. All he could see through the curtains was the shadow. Your hired killer killed the wrong man. I don't know what you're talking about. Mr. Brown, your hitman stole that notebook. That notebook and your bank statement ties you to him. It ties you to the murder. When you heard the wrong man was killed, you had to frame somebody fast. You'd heard my client threaten the father. You'd seen him that night on his way to being drunk. It couldn't have been too hard for you or Richards to follow him home and plant the murder weapon. That's just not so. Well... Here is something that is so. Your friend, Mr. Richards, died last night in a gun battle with the police. This morning he received 
We received some startling news. Ballistics discovered that the bullet that killed him did not come from a police revolver. It came from this gun. This gun, which I would like to enter as defendants next in order. You recognize this gun, Mr. Brown? Lieutenant Brock and my associate, Mr. Molansky, found this gun in your locker. You killed Mr. Richards. After Richards shot the wrong man, he tried to blackmail you. So you followed him. You found him the same time as the police, and you made sure, you made very sure, that he was dead. You had one man killed. You killed another. And next, you had to kill Stuart Horton. Who were you going to kill after that, Mr. Brown? And for what? You think you're so smart. You know what it's like being booed? Thousands of fans yelling at you that you crap when you know you can make that shot? Sports writers just calling you names when you know in your heart you still got the stuff. Forced to lose when you know you're a winner. That's like. But I, I didn't mean for old man. I want a lawyer. Your Honor, I move all charges against my client be dismissed. The people concur, Your Honor. Defense motion granted. Lieutenant Brock, take this witness into custody for questioning. This court stands adjourned. Thank you. I've got a lot to be thankful for. Give me another chance. I won't waste it. I'm sure you won't. <laughs> You were wonderful, Mr. Mason. Congratulations. No, well, thank you. May we give you two a word of advice? Of course. Sure. I believe there was a minor disagreement. No, uh, it was nothing. Amy, you feel Ken doesn't have any confidence in you. That's right. Ken. You feel as if Amy has invaded your area of capability and expertise. <laughs> I wouldn't put it that way. I would. May we both point out that both of you, in your separate and individual ways, contributed to the solution of this case. You both were right. Take it from us. Never end a day where one of you is wrong. Today was a great day, and both of you were right. Thank you. No, thank you. And thank you. <laughs> again? Never. But I'm sure it was Krugman. You'd be willing to testify that if I managed to find him. Of course. But now I must go. Can't tell you how grateful I am you agreed to see me. It's beginning to think I was chasing a ghost. Unfortunately, he's very much alive. Au revoir, Captain Berman. Au revoir. Merci.
You know, you haven't heard a word I've said all night. Something about Cleveland? You're back in your Dita Krugman mode, aren't you? It's that obvious, huh? David, I know how badly you want to find Krugman. I mean, I know that's why you swung a transfer here. I know he did something terrible to your family. For God's sake, you've only been in Paris a few months, and the man's been missing for 45 years. You didn't expect it to be easy, did you? Of course not. Besides, but... you can't even be sure that Washington tip is valid in the first place. No, Krugman is alive, all right, and he's living somewhere here in Paris. That tip came straight from my friend at the OSI. I've worked at the embassy for two years, and I don't know what that is. It's the Office of Special Investigations. They're the guys that track down Nazis living in the States. Anyhow, Elsa Ramsey was a Midanek survivor, and she saw Krugman here not more than a week ago. I never heard much about Midanek. Was it like Auschwitz? Uh, smaller, but yeah, just as bad. Anyhow, maybe this Elsa Ramsey made a mistake, and it wasn't him. Then why was she murdered? Well, you don't know. She was. It could have been an accident. No, no. She spots Krugman, tells the Surete. I talk to her, and 15 seconds later, she's dead. That's no accident. You know, I mean, I saw it. That car deliberately ran her down. Say you're right. That Krugman is here. Well, you keep after him, you could wind up splattered all over the street or something. I don't want that to happen. She saw her mother and father, my grandparents, you understand? She saw them taken to the gas chambers. And her two brothers murdered, I mean, right in front of her eyes. Krugman would have killed her, too, if he had the chance. As it is, he pretty well left her crippled for life. I'm sorry, I didn't know. In fact, she just had another operation on her legs. I couldn't tell you how many that makes. Funny, when I was a little kid, I used to think my mother lived at the hospital and just came to our house to visit. But how do you possibly expect to find him? You don't even know what he looks like, right? No, no one's ever seen a picture of him, even from when he was young. So, all you have is a sort of a rough description from your mother, and she was, what, 13 years old at the time? I know it is not going to be easy. If it was easy, they would have found him years ago. But I have to keep looking. I just, I just have to. Can't you understand that? Of course. I just don't want to see you overshadow everything else in your life. Like us, for instance. Captain Berman, please. You will join me in the van. What the hell are you talking about? I'm afraid I must insist. I assure you I mean you no harm. David, don't. Don't be afraid. Captain Berman will be returned home safely. Now hurry, please. Okay, I think you better tell me what's going on. I must apologize to you for what may seem as cheap melodrama, but sometimes we are forced to take extreme measures. Yeah, who the hell is we? You do not need to know that. All you need to know, Captain, is that like you, for years we also have been searching for Dieter Krugman. And we believe now that he is here in Paris. Where is he? He goes by the name of Altman. Felix Altman. A successful businessman. Well, if you're so sure he's Krugman, why don't you go to the police? He's a wanted war criminal. Because, as yet, we lack sufficient evidence. All we have are rumors and one inconclusive photograph. A photograph? We believed we also had an eyewitness, the same one you had, Elsa Ramsey. Look, if uh, you and uh, who you work with, if you're so sure you've got Krugman, then why don't you just find another Maidenek survivor that can make the identification? Because the death camp at Maidenek was just that, Captain. A death camp. Survivors were not the end product. That is why we need your help, Captain Berman. Me? We have sources at the police, at the Surete. They told us of your interest in Krugman. We investigated and learned that your mother is a Maidenek survivor. We would like you to bring her to Paris so she can make the identification. I don't know. 
When can I see that photograph? A rare picture. It has obviously changed in 45 years. Which is why we need your mother's testimony. Where can I see him? You can't see him at home or in his office. He refuses to see strangers. But we have learned that every Thursday morning he goes to a mineral spa outside the city. Where is this spa? It's called L'Eau de Dieu. It is near Barbizon. I'll go tomorrow. You have a car? I can borrow one. How do I contact you? We will contact you. And now you're free to go. Just as I promised the young lady. Major's a good guy. I just said I had some urgent personal business, and he gave me the day off. Oh, I still don't think you should go. I mean, if he is Krugman, then he's a very dangerous... Look, we talked that all out. I've got to go. I want to see what he looks like. That's all I want, really. You sure it's okay about the car? Yeah, as long as you don't go over 110. I'll have to pack my five. Maybe I should cop an urgent personal business plea, too, and go along with you. Well, I can probably get away, too. No, it's my problem. I'll deal with it. It's better I go along. Really. Here's the quickest way to get there. But make nice, huh? It's a classy joint. Come on, I'll show you where I parked the car. And you better get back to work. Don't worry. I'll be okay. Monsieur Rondeau, oui, de 26, donc de 15h30 à 17h30. Parfait. Oui. Uh, Parlez anglais? Uh, yes, I do. I have a message for Mr. Felix Altman. If you go through that door and down the stairs, you will find Mr. Altman in room 8. that you want here. Out with it. It's not important. If you have something to say to me, then say it. I have nothing to say to you. I think you do. You want to talk about my Dinek? Leave us, please. Who are you? How did you get in here? Doesn't matter. Ah, but I think it does matter. No, what matters, Herr Krugman, Krugman? is what you did at Maidenek. What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. My name is Altman. Felix Altman. Please, don't lie to me. I've seen your picture. You're Dieter Krugman. No, oh, man, you're a fool. <laughs> Appelle la police. It's been over three years, Perry. Not since Dan's funeral. I know, Helene, and I'm sorry. We've been too long apart. No. No apologies necessary. 
We're too long friends for that. Besides, I never contacted you either. There's still no excuse. <laughs> Stan will always be my closest friend. He always said you were the one who got him through law school. No. No, in class, he always took the best notes. But you. How are you? Fine. They tell me I'll be out of here in a few days. Same old problem? Mm. Now it's my hip. All the pressure from the bad leg. All right, Elaine. Why did you call me? You remember our son, David. Of course I remember it. Well, now he's a captain with the Marines. He's attached to the American Embassy in Paris. Not a bad assignment. He's being charged with murder. Tell me. He's accused of killing Dieter Krugman. The Nazi? The one from Meidenek? The, uh, the one who did that? Could you help him, Perry? France has a different code of law. I don't, I don't even speak the language. He, he told me on the telephone, he thinks maybe he'll be turned over to the military or a court-martial. My associate will be on his way to Paris tomorrow morning. I'll join him day after. Oh, oh Perry, thank you. In the first place, why did you go out there? Because after all these years, I, I had to see him in the flesh. I had to know if it was really him. And it was Dieter Krugman. His wife admitted it to the press. Besides, he pretty much looked like the picture. It's funny, I was expecting to see some sort of vicious monster. All there was was this pathetic old man. You don't know where the gun came from. I didn't even see it. I guess whoever shot him just tossed it on the floor. Could it have been the man who kidnapped you, the one in the van? David, we want to know the truth, all of it. Maybe in some kind of blind rage, you actually did kill him. No. You've been hunting him for years. You've been angry for years. You wanted revenge for years. Yes, but not that kind. Then what? I wanted to expose him to the world as, as the kind of monster he was, so that nobody would ever forget. What do they say? Those who don't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Mr. Mason, my dad said that you were the best lawyer he ever knew. Will you do it? Will you represent me? You're entitled to military counsel. But I'd rather you handle it by yourself, if possible. Well, David, it's been a long time since my court-martial days. But I imagine it'll all come back. Mr. Mason. Lieutenant Fletcher, investigating officer for the court martial. How do you do? This is my associate, Ken Milansky. We've met. Mm -hmm. There's a rumor, Mr. Mason, that you're going to represent Captain Berman before the court. More than a rumor, we are. In that case, it's something you should know. We sent the gun that was recovered at the murder scene to Washington for testing. It arrived back this morning. And it's definitely been identified as the weapon that fired the lethal round. I would have expected that. The serial number on the gun indicates it was the 9mm automatic. Issued to Captain David Berman the day he reported here for duty. Of course, Mr. Mason, I'll be glad to help however I can. A thing like this reflects very badly on the entire consular service even if it only involves a single Marine. You're talking about Moscow? Well, yes. And by the way, Mr. Mason, I must tell you that I have already been interviewed by Lieutenant Fletcher 
And I'm afraid I had to tell him the truth. Good. The truth is that it was common knowledge within the embassy that Captain Berman had this obsession, you'd have to call it, about finding Krugman. Mr. Ambassador, thank you. Please send Mr. Mitchell in. Uh, here's some tangible help I can offer. Ah, Mr. Mitchell, come in, please. I want you to meet Mr. Perry Mason and Mr. Ken Molansky. They'll be representing Captain Berman at the court-martial. Gentlemen, this is Kurt Mitchell of our American Services Division. Good to meet you. Hi. Mr. Mitchell is a close friend of Captain Berman, and I'm assigning him to you while you're here. He can also arrange to get you some clerical help. You speak French and German, don't you, Kurt? Enough so that I'm not intimidated by the waiters, and enough to cut through a lot of bureaucratic red tape. Great. Since Della couldn't make the trip, Kurt can take her place. Della? I hope the change in gender won't be a problem. I think we can make the adjustment. But, yes, you can help us, Mr. Mitchell. Gladly, but please call me Kurt. All right, Kurt. Mr. Molansky has the names of some people we'd like to talk to. I need their addresses and their phone numbers. Is that people within the embassy? Oh, no. Potential witnesses. Altman's widow, the masseur at the spa, the family of that woman who was killed, Elsa Ramsey, and... Oh, yes, one person at the embassy, uh, Kathy. Kathy. Kathy Bramwell. I'll get right on it. Now, Mr. Mason, I will do whatever I can to facilitate your stay. But I myself must maintain a totally neutral position with regard to the guilt or innocence of Captain Berman. Uh, what I mean is, I can't interfere with the progress of the court martial. We wouldn't want it any other way, Mr. Ambassador. This is Berman's apartment. Look at this door jam. Obviously forced open. By whom, Mr. Mason? After Captain Berman left, the murderer could have broken in, found the gun, and then proceeded David to the spa. Where they waited for Berman to arrive and then killed Altman. Or Krugman, rather. While Berman was still in the room with him. That's right. Or Captain Berman could have forced it to open himself. So it would look exactly the way you just theorized. Again, you're right. After all, Captain Berman knew the gun would be traced back to him. Why go to all that trouble? Why not just get another gun? Because as a foreigner, it wouldn't have been easy for him to procure one. And besides, he didn't have the time. According to his own story, he only knew Krugman was going to be there the night before. Mr. Mason, I'm afraid all this just won't help your case very much. David's goal was to bring Krugman to justice. Not to kill him. Well, maybe French justice wouldn't have been enough for him. As you probably know, France doesn't have capital punishment. Is everything all right? Not really. I have those uh, telephone numbers and addresses that you requested. Well, thank you. Now I need a copy of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. I'll have one sent over to your hotel, Mr. Mason. Well, Lieutenant, thank you for all your help. No, ask anything you want. All right. All right. I know you were good friends with David's parents and all, but do you really think he didn't do it? I think he didn't do it. And as I told Lieutenant Fletcher, I think he never intended to do it. But he had a fixation and a great frustration about Krugman. Elaine told me all David ever talked about was trying to find Krugman, have him tried publicly in France under the crimes against humanity laws. Yeah, but why France? Why not some other country that has capital punishment? I mean, weren't most of the Maidenac survivors Poles and Germans? There were French nationals, too, like Elaine, like her whole family. That's right. So where do we start tomorrow? With the usual suspects. I'll start with Krugman's widow. You start with Kathy Bramwell. Yes, I've known for years my husband was Didier Krugman. How did you find out? Before we were married, I was helping him to move from his apartment. And by chance, I came across his identification card of Madnik. So he had to admit who he was. He swore to me he intended to tell me before we were married. He wanted no secrets between us. And then he 
He burned the identification card. He warned me people would always be looking for him. Madame Altman, did you know the kind of man Dieter Krugman was? I knew the kind of man people thought he was. And still you married him. You did not know Felix, Mr. Mason. He was a kind and decent man. It is impossible to believe he was the monster people claim. Aside from people who were looking for Dieter Krugman, did he have any enemies? Uh, let me put it this way. Did Felix Altman have any enemies? All successful businessmen have enemies, Mr. Mason. Any who hated him enough to want him killed? Well, there is one. I don't want to say he could have done it, but he was very angry with my husband. Go on. His name is André Marchand. And your husband found out André Marchand had embezzled several million francs from the business and fired him. How did you know that? Are the police looking into this embezzlement? Yes, of course. Thank you very much for your time, Madame Altman. Mr. Mason, you do not believe the American soldier murdered Felix? No, I do not. Do you have any pictures of your husband? I have none. He was always afraid someone would see the photograph and recognize him as Krugman. He led a very fearful life, Monsieur. We both did. guys do that in New York. They mime and flesh there. <laughs> Touche. Hey, how about that? Practically a native. Well, I guess we better get going. You probably have to be back at your desk. Anyway, you were saying you actually got the license plate number of that van? After I drove away with David, I wrote it down on a piece of paper. At least whatever I could remember. Then when he called me later and said everything was okay, I just forgot about it. Still have that piece of paper? In my pocket. I think it's important. Could it help David? It might. I remember there were a couple of sevens and a nine. I don't know. Anyhow, I'll get it for you. I'll tell you something else. I think I've seen that same van a couple of times since. Really? Where? When I went out shopping after work the other night. Then yesterday, I... My God. There it is. Los, schnell. Yes, I worked for Felix Altman for over 10 years. But this isn't one of his stores. It's mine. And it took all the money I made. Three million francs. That you were told I embezzled from Altman. You see, I know what they say. But you did not do that. For the past five years, Felix wanted to make me a partner in his business. Then, two months ago, he changed his mind. Just like that. 
So I merely paid myself a bonus. For the franc, exactly what I would have got if he had kept his promise. I consider it a fair settlement. Of course, he found out and fired you. Yes, but that was all her doing. Madame Altman? She made him change his mind about the partnership. Why? Because she is the most greedy and cold-hearted person I have ever met. In fact, it would not surprise me to learn that she was in some way responsible for her husband's death. She said the same about you. That does not surprise me. Do you know her history, monsieur? Well, I know she'd been a dancer in the Folie Bergère, and that she was much younger than her husband. When she became too old to appear naked on the stage, she seduced the old man into marriage. Why would she want him dead? Because lately the company had been losing money and she wanted him to sell out so she could keep all her precious capital. But he refused, so now she can keep the company. Oh, and collect the insurance. I see. Tell me, Marshal, did you have any idea Felix Altman was really Dieter Krugman? No. But he was always a very private, very secretive man. Meanwhile, you're facing a charge of embezzlement. Which I'm sure will be withdrawn once all the facts are known. Well, they'll certainly have a harder time proving their case now that their chief witness is dead. Monsieur, I believe I am through answering your questions. Perhaps you are. Perhaps not. Excuse the way the place looks. I wasn't expecting visitors. Well, don't worry about it. Anyhow, I know exactly where I put it. Oh, God. Maybe you weren't expecting visitors. You sure as hell had some. It's gone. The license number. They took it. Somebody is getting very proficient at breaking into apartments. It had to be the kidnapper. It would certainly look that way. Ferry thinks that your friends in the van weren't so friendly. That they might have set you up, framed you for Krugman's murder. Maybe, but whatever. I don't want you to involve Kathy anymore. She's already involved. She saw your kidnapper, and as far as they know, she saw their license numbers. Well, then you've got to protect her. We'll do everything we can. Hello, Della. Right on time. How are you? I'm just fine. How's it going over there? Still trying to sort our way through 45 years of history. Well, I suppose there's a worse place to do it. Oh, by the way, the district attorney is asking for a continuance on that Haskell case. Tell the DA it's fine with me. But did you reach the INS about Elsa Ramsey? That's what I'm really calling about. Elsa Ramsey was born in Poland, Elsa Brodsky. And later, during the war, she was in Majdanek. After that, she married a GI by the name of Arthur Ramsey. He brought her back to Ohio, to his hometown, and then later they had a baby girl named Marie. What happened to Ramsey? From all the information I can gather, he just dropped out of sight when the daughter was about 13. Where is the daughter now? She's living right there in Paris, working for a designer named Vicky Teal. Oh, that's interesting. Good work. All right, enough about business. How are you? Are you all right? All right? Why wouldn't I be? Well, you know when you're over there, you eat that rich food. Rich food? Here in Paris? Della, you're imagining things. Say hello for me. Ken sends his regards. Meanwhile, I'll check with you every day. Give you a cholesterol count. You're bad, Perry. Bad. Bad, bad, bad. Bye, Della. 
I would like you to talk to a woman named Marie Ramsey. She's Elsa Ramsey's daughter. She works for the fashion designer Vicky Teal. Find out if she has anything that might link the Krugman murder to her mother's murder. Look, I don't want to sound paranoid, but I really am worried about Kathy. If that van is following her... Don't worry, David. Two can play at that game. Um, you speak English? Probably better than I speak French. Oh. Yeah. Uh, what does a dress like this go for, anyway? 8,400 francs. Ugh. Wow, that's, uh, 1,200 bucks? Closer to 14. Your name Marie Ramsey? Mm-hmm. Mind if I ask you a few questions? About the dress? About your mother. Yes, I would mind. I don't like people who make me feel like a fool. Now, wait a second. I've never been to a place like this before. I was curious about the dress. But that's not why you came in here, is it? You came in to pry about my mother. Look, I'm a lawyer from the States. I work with another attorney named Perry Mason. We're representing David Berman, the Marine who's accused of killing Dieter Krugman. And you don't think he did it? No, we don't. That's why I'm here. Maybe you better explain that. All right. We're trying to find if there's a connection between your mother's death and Krug. He's the one who murdered her. What makes you think that? It had to be him. My mother didn't have an enemy in the world except for Dieter Krugman. And your mother thought she saw him two weeks ago on the street? She did see him. She went to the Sarate, but they said there was nothing they could do for her. But Berman had been making inquiries about Krugman, so I guess they told him and he contacted her. This is kind of personal. But after... After your father, after, after he... After he ran out on us? Why'd your mother bring you back here? Why not Poland? She couldn't face the memories. The nightmare. And she had friends here. Could you tell me about it? The nightmare? I'm afraid I have to get back to the showroom right now. I got all the time in the world. My mother was sent to Maidenek as forced labor, as a laundress. Maybe you don't know, but Maidenek wasn't like Auschwitz or Treblinka. Yeah, in what way? I mean, there was a death camp, but there was also an internment center attached to it. A concentration camp. That's where my mother worked. But Krugman was at the death camp. Yes, but because of my mother's duties, she had to go there to the other side. And Krugman was famous, if that's the word. Even then, that's how she recognized him here. But how could she after 45 years? Well, she said he changed, but she could never forget his eyes. You looked into them and you actually saw the face of evil. Besides, she had a picture picture of her and a lot of the other might next staff including Krugman she said how ashamed she was being forced to pose for those animals but she kept it because she never wanted to forget how bad life could get uh, look Miss Ramsey uh, is it possible I could see that picture you were talking about I've never seen it myself and I've stored my mother's things yeah, it might be important I'd have to go through the boxes tonight or in the morning. Come on, I, I'd really appreciate it. All right. I'll come by and pick it up tomorrow. Hello? If I find it, why don't I just send it to your hotel? Molanski? No. Um, no. wait a second. That, that's me. Your name's Molanski? Molanski, Borowski. Maybe we're even related. Hello? Yeah, Perry. No kidding. Where? Okay, I'm on my way. I'll see you tomorrow.
You sure must have a lot of pull with the ambassador to get me all this time off. He's being very cooperative. Anyhow, I'm so glad you're representing David. I just wish I could be of more help. If only I could remember that stupid license number. It may not be important, Kathy. But it is. This is far enough. What's far enough? Are you certain you could recognize David's kidnapper if you saw him again? Oh, sure. I mean, it was only a few seconds, but I'd know him anywhere. Look over there. A van. Why don't you give me the keys? No. You see over there, the gendarme? Ah. He's been following us since we started our little walk. Well, what can we do? What we can do has been done. Let's go. That's him. That's the man who took David. What do you want? Who are you? Who do you work for? I cannot tell you that. Then perhaps you would like to tell those gendarmes over there why you engage in kidnapping and murder. We do not murder. Ken, ask some of those fellows over there to step over here, will you? Sure. No. Wait. What is it you want? I want to know who you are and what you're after and who you work for. It will take a moment. You have just one. Now, come and see me a bit. I've been here with David Berman's Rechtsanwalt. Er droht Ihnen mit der Polizei, wenn er Sie nichts sprechen darf. Also das. You will be at the Trocadero at 6.45 tonight. A car will pick you up and you will come alone. I want some identification from you. A passport, driver's license. I'll return it tonight. Carl Meyerhoff. Well, Carl Meyerhoff, if that car doesn't arrive at 6.45, the Surete will be looking for you. The car will be there. Give him back the keys. I like it. You're taking a big chance. I'm sure before this is over, we'll both be taking a big chance. So you asked the Surete about Meyerhoff? Yes, but so far nothing. And I'm checking up on Daniel Altman and Andre Marchand. Oh, and I have a list of the court martial brass, most of them coming in from Brussels, from NATO. That car should be here. I still don't think you should go. Not alone. I agree. You don't know these people. How about Kurt and I follow behind in my car? No, if they spot you, they'll call it off. We can't take that chance. This might be it. You have a pen? Here's the number Meyerhoff punched in on his mobile phone. If I'm not back in two hours, give it to the Sorte. My orders are that you come alone. My friends just came to see me off. Can't make out the plates. Doing. He usually does, but tonight, I don't know.
Carl, our chair for our guest. Uh, no, I, I won't stay very long. You... You wanted to see me, Mr. Mason. I don't know your name. Otto Rossen. That still doesn't tell me very much. Mr. Mason, have you ever heard of the Treblinka uprising in 1943? Yes. Almost 60 prisoners escaped the death camp. And I was one of them. I lived in the woods like an animal for six months. During this time, I made a promise to God and to myself that if I survived, I would spend the rest of my life tracking down the Nazi barbarians who visited their unspeakable horrors against the world. That's what you do now? For 44 years, I've been a hunter. I worked behind the scenes with your own OSI in Washington, with my friend Simon Wiesenthal, and with others all over the world. Wiesenthal and the others work out in the open, with the public. As did I, Mr. Mason, until a few years ago when our offices in West Berlin were firebombed and three of our people died. We've been obliged to go undercover since we came here in search of Krugman. I represent David Berman, charged with the murder of Dieter Krugman. I'm looking for the person who committed that murder. <laughs> you imagine it might be me or someone who works with me? Well, now that I know who you are, that conclusion doesn't seem unreasonable. Why should we want to kill Dieter Krugman? Because he's your prey, and France does not have the death penalty. Ah, but you miss two important points. First, we could easily have arranged for Krugman to be transported to a country where there is the death penalty. He committed crimes against the humanity of many nations. In truth, we regret that Krugman is dead. If he'd been captured and put on trial, the impact on the public would have been immeasurably more powerful. And Mr. Mason, the public, the world, must never be allowed to forget. But I still don't know why you have to go in for so much cloak and dagger, so much secrecy. Because, as I told you, we had to go underground. And because Odessa has a price on my head, a very, <laughs> very flattering amount, I must admit. You've heard of Odessa, Mr. Mason? A network of ex-Nazis and Nazi sympathizers. Many people assume that Odessa is only fiction, but unfortunately it's all too real, and its tentacles are everywhere. So this cloak and dagger you refer to is our means of preserving our security. <laughs> I'd like to see the picture of Krugman that was shown to Captain Berman. I thought you'd ask. Carl? Many of these butchers had very little trouble establishing new identities after the war. May I keep this? Of course. I know your reputation. And if Captain Berman is innocent, he has nothing to fear. I shall have you driven back to your hotel. I'm Mr. Mason. Good night, Mr. Rosen. Hey, good morning. Bonjour. Oh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's really beautiful. Look, you don't have to keep pretending. I'm not pretending, I like it. This is the only thing you really came to see. My mother's the one on the right. Which one's Krugman? She didn't say. She never talked about it. Too painful, she said. Anyhow, you keep it as long as you need it, but I'd like it back. Do you have any plans for dinner tonight? You don't need to do that. I know I don't. But I'm a stranger in town, and I don't speak the language, and I thought it would be nice to have dinner with a fellow American, especially such a beautiful one. I don't think that's such a good idea. Besides, I'm not American. I've spent more time here than in the States. I pretty well think of myself as French. Well, then do it in the name of closer U.S.-French relations. Think of uh, Gene Kelly and Leslie Caron. Okay. Dinner. 
But no dancing through any fountains. <laughs> Darn. I'll call you later. Well, we sure got here a lot faster than I did the other day. I just wish I hadn't come in the first place. Let's go. They're expecting us. And I was standing right here. And the shot sounded like it came from right behind me. Next thing I knew, they grabbed me, and that's all I really know. So, somebody could have fired from in back of that door and escaped unseen. Everybody who came in after that shot came through that door. Where does this door lead? To a storage room. Does it have an outside entrance? Well, that's one theory, Mr. Mason. But it's a bit hypothetical to convince the court martial. Lieutenant, you were right about that today, but today is not tomorrow. The court is called for 10 a.m. Let's go. What about the fingerprints on the gun? What about them? There were no fingerprints, you know that. But doesn't that work for David? Not really. Prosecution could argue how this cold and calculating defendant carefully wiped his fingerprints from the gun as his victim lay dead at his feet. And what does that leave us with? I mean, if David didn't do it, then who did? You tell me. Daniel Altman, for the money? It's possible. We should check that insurance out. I've got some stuff on her coming in the morning. Andre Marchand? Mm -hmm. Another possible. Kurt, see if the Surete can verify his whereabouts the day of the murder. Okay. But my source says he may have some other important information on Marchand. What about Meyerhoff or this Otto Rosen? No. After what you told me, they're off the list. Who else? I got no idea. Maybe somebody we don't know of yet? Maybe another Maidenac survivor. There is another possibility. Who? Compare that photo with the one you got from Marie Ramsey. This one's from Rosen? Yep. It's the same face. So... Elsa Ramsey did recognize Krugman on the street and was probably killed for it. So who is this other suspect? If uh, your mother were murdered, wouldn't you want vengeance on whoever did it? By the way, Ken, how did your dinner go this evening? Perry. There's no way she could have done it. Probably not. When you return that photo, do a little digging. Whatever you say. But I can't even imagine her being involved. Nor could I. Gentlemen, the court-martial starts at 10 a.m. in the morning. We'd like to speak to Madame Altman. I'm sorry. Madame Altman is in conference. And can I be discussed? Can you see that we uh, have an appointment, will you? No problem. Just a moment, monsieur. You can go in there. Actually, it's very easy. I've been here before. Remember? Uh, you'd better stay, Marchand. I'm glad to find the two of you together. It saves me a visit. What do you want? I thought we'd share some information. We're not interested. I certainly was. You see, the Surete has no report of any embezzlement by Marchand. I suspect there wasn't any. I think you'd better go now. What happened was your husband discovered that you and Marchand had been having an affair. You don't know what you're talking about. So he fired you and threatened to divorce you. If you do not go now, I will call the security. He was ashamed to let anyone around him know how he'd been betrayed, so he concocted the cover story of an embezzlement. After he was dead, it suited your purpose to let the story stand. When we talked, each of you pointed an accusing finger at the other to disguise the fact that you were lovers. 
Why would we do that? So nobody would guess you had a definite motive to kill your husband? And what would that be? Get him out of the way before he could divorce you. So you'd inherit whatever estate he had left, plus whatever insurance there was. The two of you would live happily ever after. It's lies, a pack of lies. Andre, please, be quiet. Mr. Mason, some of what you say is true. We are lovers. But we had nothing to do with the killing of my husband. I swear it to you. You may have to. In front of a court-martial that starts in half an hour. Bonjour. Yes, sir. As soon as the local sureté was given proof that Captain Berman carried a diplomatic passport, both he and the gun found at the scene were turned over to me. And you had the gun sent on to Washington? Yes, sir, to Corps headquarters, along with the bullet taken from the deceased body. They forwarded both items to the Department of Defense, where Marine Intelligence made ballistics tests. Excuse me, Mr. President. Defense is willing to stipulate that the gun found at the murder scene was the same weapon that fired the fatal bullet. Thank you, Counselor. In that case, I have no further questions for Lieutenant Fletcher. No questions. Thank you, Lieutenant Fletcher. You may step down. Please call your next witness. Master Sergeant Frederick Hansen. The serial number on the 9mm automatic that Lieutenant Fletcher gave me corresponded to the serial number on the gun that I myself issued to Captain Berman on the 6th of August of this year. The date he reported for duty at the embassy here? You sure? I keep very careful records, sir. As a matter of fact, I brought them with me if you'd like to show them to the court. Defense will stipulate the gun that killed the deceased was the same gun issued to the defendant. Thank you, Mr. Mason. No questions, sir. No questions. Thank you, Sergeant Hanson. Colonel Calvelli, you may call your next witness. Sir, I'm afraid he isn't here yet. I didn't expect all these stipulations from the defense, and I told him 11 o'clock. Well... In that case, we'll call a short recess. Court will resume at 11.30. Colonel Calvelli, you will inform us if there are any additional schedule problems? Of course, sir. Is that good? Never hurts to rattle the other side a little. We could use a little more time. Good news, Mr. Mason. At least I think it is. There was a 10 million franc insurance policy on Altman's life, and Danielle Altman is the sole beneficiary. Interesting. But that still only goes to motive. We need a lot more. I have things to do. Lieutenant Fletcher, why don't we all get a cup of coffee? Well, Mr. Ambassador, sit down. Mr. Mason. Things don't seem to be going well. I'd like to ask you for a little help. Certainly. Perhaps someone in the State Department could contact the Soviet Procurator General's office in Moscow. The Soviets? What for? The Russians liberated Maidenek in 45, and they'd still have all the records. I'd like to see everything they have on Dieter Krugman. You really think they'll cooperate? Yes, I do. But I'd appreciate it if you'd keep your inquiry as private as possible. I'll do what I can, but why do you need their files on Krugman? Well, so far I have a lot of questions and very few answers. Maybe the Soviets can supply some. Or maybe not. Yes, he seemed very intense. Very, I say it, menacing. Objection. Calls for a conclusion. Move to strike. Sustained. The witness's answer will be stricken. What exactly did Captain Berman say? He said he wanted to talk to Monsieur Altman about... Maidenek, is it? Mm -hmm. Then I left the room. But after I shut the door, I could still hear voices. Angry voices. Then what happened? Didier and I... Didier is the receptionist. We heard the shot, 
and we ran back to the room, we saw the American staring down at Monsieur Altman's body. Did you see the gun? Yes, it was on the floor, not far from the body. And this American that you saw, is he here in this courtroom today? Well, he's seated right over there. Indicating the defendant, Captain Berman. Sir, no further questions. Monsieur Dario, could you tell us if there's another door to that room other than the one leading to the hallway? Yes, it leads to a room that's used for storage. And from there, there is a door leading to the outside. What? So, it's entirely possible that some other person could have hidden behind that door, shot Monsieur Altman, and then escaped without being seen. It is possible, I suppose, but I didn't see any such person. Thank you, Monsieur Dario. And neither did anyone else. I move that last remark be stricken. The court will please disregard the witness's unsolicited response. No, it's not going too well. But we haven't been up the bat yet. So will you be going right back to the States after the trial? I don't know. Why? Just thought since you were here, you might take some vacation time. Uh, I doubt it. Too many cases pending back home. How about you? How about me what? Oh, you think you'll come back? To the States? Why would I? Well, it was your mother's idea to come here and, uh, well, you know. I told you, this is my home now. But, uh, what if you were to get involved with some American? Where is it written that a woman has to follow a man? I mean, if a man truly cared, couldn't he think about relocating here? Makes sense, I guess. <laughs> Look, there's something I gotta ask you. That sounds a little ominous. Not really. After your mother died, did you ever try to find Krugman yourself? Why do you want to know? No reason. I mean, it just seems like it would be kind of a natural instinct to want to find Krugman. Bring him to justice. Is that what this is all about? You really want to cross-examine me, accuse me of murder? Marie, wait a second. No, you know what you are? You know what your problem is? You're a fake. You just don't say what you want. You always have to enter into some stupid little game. Marie, now, wait just, a just second. give me my picture back and leave me alone. understand is why anybody would want that picture so badly don't worry about it the security people at the embassy made me copies yesterday good give one to marie hello yeah hold on it's ambassador todd hold on a minute mr ambassador Good. Yes, I hope so, too. 
And Mr. Ambassador, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> the Russians are cooperating. We should be getting their Krugman file by courier sometime around noon tomorrow. I hope it helps. France may not have the death penalty, but a U.S. court martial does. Well, I, I, I don't know that I'd call it an obsession. What would you call it? Objection. What she would call it is irrelevant. Sustained. But he arranged to have himself transferred to Paris, made repeated inquiries about Krugman at the Surete, even met with a woman who claimed that she could identify him. Now, surely that was more than just idle curiosity. Objection. Witness is not a psychiatrist. Sustained. Miss Bramwell, isn't it true that the defendant often said that no matter what, he had to find Dieter Krugman? Objection irrelevant and calls for hearsay. No. It goes to state of mind and motive. Overruled, Mr. Mason. You may answer the question, Miss Bramwell. Yes. That's what he said. No more questions. Miss Bramwell, what did David tell you was his ultimate objective when he found Krugman. Objection. No foundation or relevancy. Oh, Mr. President, it was Colonel Calvelli's inquiries that opened the door to this subject. Overruled. The witness may answer the question. He wanted a public trial so everyone in the world would know what Krugman did. Did he ever say one word, one word, about wanting to kill the man? No. Looks like the prosecution will wrap things up this afternoon. Having proved their case, motive, weapon, opportunity. Here it is, Mr. Mason. Moscow. Our decoding people made a translation for you. Ken. Bring David to the conference room. Does that help? Maybe the break we've been looking for, but I need more help from you. You know my ground rules. No, 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 believe me. Nothing will compromise your neutrality. I want serious cooperation from the local Surete. Well, Mr. Mitchell's been in touch with them. I'm sure he can... No, help. no, no. I, I don't think Kurt can handle this. For what I have in mind, the request has to come from the highest level. Besides, there's a question of time. Well, tell me exactly what you want to do what I can. David, I want your consent to bring your mother here to testify. Well, what for? I mean, you saw her. She's just getting over surgery. I know. We'll make sure she's well taken care of. But what can she do? For starters, she just might save your life. What are you talking about? Who's this? According to the Russians, that's a picture of Dieter Krugman. No, it isn't. Why not? You've seen the picture of Krugman. This isn't the same man. Maybe he had plastic surgery. A lot of those guys did. That is Krugman, right? Yes. Both photos show a man in SS uniform. Now, why would he have had plastic surgery before the war ended? Okay, you're right, he wouldn't. But it doesn't make sense. That's why I need your mother here, to explain the discrepancy. She's very fragile, Mr. Mason. She's always been. She survived my neck. Okay. talked to the doctor and he said it's all right for her to travel but matter of fact i think even if he'd said no she would have come that sounds like helene all right when you talk to her tell her ken will meet her at the plane and she'll be staying at the royal monceau with us right right uh, i think you should know though perry 
Even with her faith in you, she's still very worried. Well, she's not the only one. But don't tell her that. Perry. Bye, Della. As you heard, I want you to meet Elaine. I booked her on flight 1110, arriving early at noon. Please bring her directly to the embassy. What about the court-martial? Oh, Colonel Butler's giving us a one-day delay. Well, that's good. Good. Elaine's testimony could be the key to this whole case. Feel is a gun, and I will use it if you do not do as I say. Come on, let's go. You have friends arriving here, Meyerhoff? David, is that the man? Yeah, that's him. Sir, you're under arrest. See you tomorrow. Don't turn out. Mr. Mason. Second, I thought everything got fouled up. Now what? We just let French justice take its course, head back to the hotel. Back to the hotel? What for? David's mother arrived two hours ago on the Concorde. Kathy's with her. train for three days. My mother and father, my two brothers and me, and probably 70 others in one box car, and no food or water the last day and a half. How old were you? Fifteen. My brothers were 14 and 17. Please go on. Finally, at dawn of the fourth day, the train stopped at Maidenek. They forced us to jump off the train. And I saw my mother and father shoved into a group of people and marched away. There were no goodbyes. I learned later they were taken directly to the gas chambers. Then my brothers and I, along with many other children our ages, were marched to some kind of a holding area. My brother Jean went up to this SS man and demanded to know where they had taken our parents. He did not answer, but he, he just raised this iron pipe he carried and smashed Jean to the ground with it. Then my other brother Alan ran to the man and he also was smashed to the ground. And then, then he kept hitting him until he was dead. Somehow, Jean managed to get to his feet and he, he went after the man, tried to knock him down. But the man raised the iron bar to hit Jean again. I grabbed this piece of glass and I ran at him. And I grabbed his hand and cut it as hard as I could. He screamed and shook me away. And then he brought the iron bar down on my knee. Then he went back to Jean and finished his killing. 
Then he raised the bar over my head. He would have killed me too, but another SS officer arrived and ordered it to move all of us immediately to the work barracks. He called the man with the pipe Krugman. Opt Sturmführer Krugman. I never saw him again. But I will remember his face until the day I die. Thank you, Miss Berman. I apologize for obliging you to relive that day. Now, I would like you to look at some photographs, if you will. Of course. These are photographs, Mr. President, already admitted into evidence. They are identified in your packets as A, B, and C. Mr. Prosecutor, do you have yours? Mr. Malansky, photograph A, please. Now, do you recognize that man? Yes, I recognize him. Could you tell us the name of that man? I do not know it, but it is the SS officer who came and ordered Krugman to take us away. He did not mean to, I'm sure, but he saved my life. But the man in that photograph is not Dieter Krugman. No. Photograph B, please. Now, do you recognize the same man in that photograph? Yes, that's him, right there. That man was known as Altman, Mrs. Berman. Felix Altman. But he is here, too. Who is there? Krugman. Right there. Photograph C, please, the Russian photo. And that man, that is also Dieter Krugman? Yes. Yes, that is the monster. That's Krugman. I'm sorry, Mrs. Berman. I'm sorry. I have no more questions of this witness. Colonel Calvelli? No questions, sir. That's all, madam. We thank you for helping us here today. And we'll take a 10-minute recess. Captain Berman, you have permission to assist your mother. Yes, my husband's business was failing. What did he do about that? He was désespéré. He went to everyone he knew to borrow money. To find some money to keep the business going. Did he succeed? No. Madame Altman, I have a few more questions. But I must remind you that you are still under oath. Oui, I know. Madame, what was your husband's real name? Felix Meinheim. But he changed it to Altman. He did not want anyone to know he'd been stationed at Madnik. Then why did you lie? Why did you tell the authorities and the press after he died that your husband was really Dieter Krugman? Because someone threatened to kill me. And since Felix had been murdered, I did believe they would try to kill me too. Who, Madame Altman? Who threatened to kill you? A man named Karl Meyerhoff. What is your relationship to Otto Rosen? I work for him. And on his orders, did you kidnap David Berman? Yes. On his orders, did you follow and electronically eavesdrop on Miss Catherine Bramwell? Yes. On his orders, did you threaten Danielle Altman's life? 
Yes, but of course I would not have done it. On his orders, did you kill Elsa Ramsey? No, I've never killed anybody. I see. Tell me, Mr. Meyerhoff, why were you waiting for Helene Berman at the airport yesterday? All Rosen told me was that he wanted to talk to her before she appeared at this trial. So you were just going to spirit her off. And Rosen was just going to talk to her. That's what he said. Mr. Meyerhoff, did you know that Felix Altman was not Dieter Krugman? I only knew what Rosen told me. Did you kill Felix Altman? No. Do you know who did? No, but it wasn't me. I wasn't even in Paris that day. You can verify that. I already have. No further questions. Colonel Calvelli? No questions, sir. Defense calls Otto Rosen. Mr. Rosen, you do understand that your friend Meyerhoff has just testified. Uh, yes. When your friend Meyerhoff called you to set up our meeting, I noted the number he punched on his mobile phone. I called that number the next day, found it was the office of a very prestigious brokerage house here in Paris. Really, uh, perhaps you made a mistake with the number, huh? Mr. Rosen, when we met, I asked why you were working underground. You gave me several answers, none of which I found satisfactory. I did some research. I found there'd been no bombing of any office in West Berlin three years ago, and that Mr. Wiesenthal had never heard of an Otto Rosen. Then came the question of identities. I'm grateful to the Russians for helping me sort it all out. Perhaps you will not be. I have no idea what you're talking about. Neither do I, Mr. President, and I must object to this whole line of inquiry as irrelevant. Irrelevant? Mr. President, the testimony of this witness is the essential part of our defense. And evidently, the defense is based on blue sky instead of on hard evidence. Mr. President, again, this is all irrelevant to the defendant's guilt or innocence. I assure the court, even the skeptical colonel, that the relevancy will quickly become apparent. Overall. Mr. Rosen, I submit that the office where we met was a total fake. A piece of theater you designed to convince me that you were a Jew and a Nazi hunter. Well, why... I submit, Herr Rosen, that you were and are neither. Why should you say that? I'm Otto Rosen, and I have been a Nazi hunter for 44 years. I submit, Herr Rosen, that your real name is Krugman. Dieter Krugman. Dieter Krugman? You're insane. I'm Otto Rosen. Mr. President, I beg this court's indulgence. I wish to bring into this interrogation at this time a witness, an expert witness, purely for the purposes of identification. Go ahead, Mr. Mason. Mr. Molansky. Otto Rosen. Dieter Krugman. I submit it was you who ordered Felix Altman killed and had his wife threatened. That is a terrible lie. You and Altman knew each other. You knew each other was here in Paris, both successful businessmen. You felt safe, didn't you? For one to betray the other, he would have to betray himself. But when Altman's business began to collapse, he became desperate. He came to you. He demanded money. Demanded money or he'd reveal your true identity. For Felix Altman, that was suicide. Yeah, it's an interesting theory, Mr. 
Mason, but a pity you have no proof for such wild charges. <laughs> I call the court's attention to the file from Russia, entered as Defense Exhibit 3. You will note the description of Dieter Krugman. It includes the fact that he has a scar across the back of his right hand. Now, Mr. Rosen, I would like you to show the court your right hand. You've no right to ask me anything. I'm a French citizen. Show the court your right hand. Turn it over. I wonder if that scar could have been made by a jagged piece of glass in the hands of a little girl some 45 years ago. Now, would you please remove your glasses? Remove your glasses. Mrs. Berman, do you recognize that man? Yes. The eyes of the devil. Krugman. I have no further questions of the witness. I have no questions, sir. I'm going to excuse this witness and suggest the Surete take him into immediate custody. Mr. President, in view of the fact that the prosecution has made a prima facie case against the defendant, that insufficient evidence has been produced to contradict any element of that case, I move for a directed verdict of guilty of murder in the first degree. I ask the court to defer ruling on that motion until after the testimony of my final witness. Mr. President, defense counsel continues to play his excruciating little delaying game, tantalizing us with this whole parade of mysterious witnesses, none of whom have disproved in the slightest the case against the defendant. Uh, Mr. President, this case is much more complicated than Colonel Calvelli seems able to comprehend, certainly more complicated than any of us would wish. The charge against the defendant is very serious. I believe the court should give us every reasonable opportunity to prove his innocence. Mr. Mason, Colonel Calvelli's motion is somewhat irregular, but the point is well taken. If defense has some strong evidence to present us soon, let's hear it. Yes, sir. Call your next witness. Isn't it true, Mr. Mitchell, that although Ambassador Todd assigned you to work with Mr. Melansky and myself, it was you who asked for the assignment? Yes, of course I did. David's a good friend of mine. And you? Are you a good friend of David's? Excuse me? I can't excuse you. You know, a lot of things bothered me about this case. For instance, how did Meyerhoff know the defendant was going out to dinner the night he was kidnapped? How did the photo thief know Mr. Melansky was going to return the picture to Miss Ramsey that day? And how did Elsa Ramsey's killer know she had recognized Krugman on the street? According to her daughter, the only people she talked to were the Surete and the defendant. Suddenly, a great light hit me. You. You were the only one who knew all these things, because as David's friend, he confided in you. To be sure, you were the contact. I let you make the travel arrangements for David's mother. Sure enough, there was Carl Meyerhoff, waiting for her at the airport. The right time, the right gate. You're way off base, Mr. Mason. I had nothing to do with Rosen or Krugman or whatever his name is. How long have you been in Paris, Mr. Mitchell. 
Eleven years, why? Eleven years. Do you recognize this? It looks like a paper napkin. And on it is your handwriting, is it not? I suppose so. Suppose? Is it your handwriting or is it not? It is. Those are the directions you wrote down for the defendant the day he drove out to the spa to see Felix Hoffman. So? So? You've lived in Paris for 11 years. And yet you give your friend directions that will take him at least 20 minutes longer than necessary. That's not true. Not true? Not true, Mr. Mitchell? All right, maybe I made a mistake. No mistake. You gave David Berman faulty directions. You gave yourself time to get to his apartment. Steal his gun, proceed him to the spa, and lie in wait to kill Felix Altman. What possible reason would I have to kill Altman? Mr. Mitchell, on your personnel records, you're listed as the son of Wilhelm and Gisela Mitchell, married in Milwaukee in 1956. Gisela, maiden name Krauss, immigrated to the United States in 1954. But your age here is listed as 37. That means that you're not the actual son of Wilhelm Mitchell, but a child of Gisela's from a former marriage. I would like to introduce into evidence a certified copy of a birth certificate obtained from the West German government. It lists the birth of one Kurt Johann Krugman, son of Gisela Kraus Krugman and Hans Krugman. In other words, Mr. Mitchell, you are the blood nephew of Dieter Krugman and a member of Odessa. That is a lie. That is a lie. Ein Mitglied von Odessa. Ja! Ich bin ein Krugmann. Und ich bin ein Top-Mitglied von Odessa. Und Sie werden sterben. You will die. Sergeant. Yes, sir. I move for a directed verdict of not guilty. Motion granted. The defendant is free to go. Hurt you. You're going to have to stick around a few days to fill in those blanks for the Surete. No problem. You ready? My bags are already in the taxi. I'll get mine. What are you talking about? Business. I have to go. Well, what about... I, I mean... Hell, this isn't fair. Well, I might still be there when you get back. Marie, if you think I'm going to let you get away without kissing your goodbye, you're crazy. Ivy nurse to East Wing. All right. Ivy nurse to East Wing, please. Well, All right. Pack it up. Take him out. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'll give a call right now. seats on the flight to Vegas? No, the five o'clock flight's no good. I need to leave as soon as possible. Oh, never mind. I'll drive. Dad? What's going on? How come you're home? Peter is dead, Melanie. He shot himself. Oh, God. You know, I got a call from a neighbor at work. He took him to the hospital, and it was too late. You know, he didn't even leave a note. Dad, you did everything you could. It's not your fault. I know. Listen, um, I want you to go to St. Louis and stay with your mother for a while, okay? Why? I'm supposed to spend the summer with you. I know, but I gotta leave town. I can't leave you here by yourself. Why do I have to go to Mom's? Can't I just stay with a friend or something? No, no. Come on, help me out, all right? Your plane leaves at 645. It's your flight number. Take a ticket up at the airport. You know how to do that, right? Yeah. Now, a shuttle's coming to get you at 520. Here's some money. SKY, Ken. There are two rooms. The other room's under the name of Mason. Perry Mason. My room overlooks the pool. Yours overlooks the golf course. You're gonna have a terrific time. I will if we change rooms. <laughs> but this is a hot ticket, you know. If I hadn't represented Billy Landau in his divorce, we never would have gotten ringside seats. Believe me, Perry. You're gonna love it. Ken, relax. I will love it. Will that be check or credit card, Mr. Melansky? Uh, credit card. Here. I'll wait over there. Right. Harry, Mason. Mr. Stewart. Well, you in town for court or the fight? Same thing sometimes. What about you? Well, I hope to draw some blood at the poker table. I hold a private game here every year. You may have read about it. Everybody's read about it. Or was that the whole idea? Well, my guests don't complain. You'd be surprised what a little free publicity can do for a business or for a career. Perhaps you should consider joining us this year. Thank you, no. Enjoy the flight. All set. Looks familiar. Who was that? Richard Stewart. PR guy? Yep. Friend? Nope. I saw an old friend of mine, Mr. Stewart. Uh, Mr. Stewart is a guest. Still having his famous poker game? I really couldn't say, sir. You were going to sneak off. 
up an easy one. I wasn't looking, weren't you, Martin? All no. 300 calories, all 840 milligrams total. They're just minutes. peanuts for no, crying out loud. Maybe I was saving them for you. Oh, well, maybe I'll take them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, everybody, dig in. Can't play poker on an empty stomach. Well, it's Dan, but it's not as much fun that way, I can tell you that. <laughs> hey, looky, you know, I don't know why you fellows are so upset with the Japanese. Their money is just as green as everybody's. You know, if they had run at the oil business the way they did at ours, you'd think differently, too. No, you, see, you automobile boys, you dropped the ball. You know, as fascinating as all this is, why don't we just get started? So this Cliff gets here. He was late last year, too. Man's totally irresponsible. Probably takes drugs, you know? All those showbiz people do. And they used to accuse me of making gross generalizations. Oh, Senator, listen, when you were in office, nobody could figure out what you were saying. <laughs> Hola! Housekeeping. Sorry I'm late, gentlemen. I had to sign about 100 autographs on my way to the elevator. Some guys won't do it, but somehow I just cannot say no. So I hear. Yeah, are you still in that TV sitcom where you play the wrestling coach in that girl's school? Hey, it's our eighth season. What can I say? I'm not complaining, but there is nothing <laughs> like the laughter from a live audience. Present company accepted. <laughs> <laughs> David Benson. Peter Benson's brother. You remember Peter Benson, don't you? Oh, yes. Committed suicide today. Yes, I was told. Yeah. You know, because of you, he spent the last two years watching everything that meant anything to him go down the drain. You put that bullet through his head. So now you're going to put one through mine? Is that the idea? You're damn right I am. I'm very sorry about what happened to your brother, David. But he shot himself because he was emotionally unstable. I know that. You know that. This isn't going to solve anything. I don't think that you really want to pull that trigger. That did hit him where it hurts the most when he least expects it. That's just like a politician. At least I wasn't just standing there. Get me security. Jay, get off the phone. Hang up. Gonna do with I'm going to give him back what he came in with. And then I'm going to suggest that he go. And I'm going to pretend this never happened. Right, David? Richard, don't you think you should report this to the police? I don't want him involved. I don't need that kind of publicity. No, none of us do. Oh, I'll drink to that. Let's play poker. Hello? Too bad you didn't pull the trigger, David. Who is this? How would you know about it? I've got something on Richard Stewart that you could use to great advantage. What are you talking about? What? Be at the north end of the Desert Grand parking lot in 20 minutes, and I'll tell you.
David Benson? Hi. I'm Jennifer. Sorry I'm late. Look, I can't talk long. How would you like to see Richard Stewart go to prison? I love him. Who are you? I used to be his mistress. I heard things. Lots of things. You know, about the way he does business. The people he does business with. Anyway, uh, I quit my job for him and he put me up in this real nice condo. Then about a month ago, he drops me, just like that. Left me out on the street. I want to get even. So why don't you just go to the police? Well, look, Stuart cut me off without a cent. No, he left me drowning in bills. I just need some money. How much money? About 20,000. What? Hey, your brother's dead because of Richard Stewart. I'm giving you the chance to put him away here. Yeah, but I don't have $20,000. <laughs> this is Vegas. It's pocket change to people around here. Get it. I'll call you tomorrow. Wait a minute. on the table. Melanie? Dad, it took me five bucks worth of phone calls to try and figure out which hotel you were staying in. Next time, just tell me, okay? Why aren't you in St. Louis? Well, I heard you say you were going to Vegas, so when I got to the airport, I changed my ticket. Melanie? Dad. Dad, you really scared me. I had to find out what was going on. I haven't been much of a father lately, have I? Peter died, I just lost it. I was so angry, I just wanted to kill Richard Stewart. I had a gun pointed right at him, but I couldn't do it. And I would have had to live with mom and her boyfriend for good, right? I'm sorry, I spent too much time worrying about Peter. Well, he was your brother. Yeah. Sorry, sweetheart, I'll make it up to you, okay? I'm Detective Sergeant Hollenbeck. This is Officer Parsons, Las Vegas Police Department. Are you David Benson? Yes, I am. That's my daughter, Melanie. What's going on? Can we come in? 
I understand you own a nine millimeter Beretta. Yes, I do. You have it with you? Yeah. May I see it? Yeah. Why do you want to see his gun? A man named Richard Stewart was shot and killed in his room earlier tonight. Find it, Mr. Benson? No? I didn't think you would. All right, you're coming with us. Take her to Juvenile Hall. Where the hell did she go? Are you aware that Richard Stewart was murdered last night? Very aware. Who told you, the police? Waiter who brought my coffee. Have you formed an opinion? Just one. Now look, Mr. Mason is here for the fight. He has nothing to do with this case. Now please, just leave him alone. Miss? Oh, God. I'm sorry I fell asleep. Um, I'm Melanie Benson. I got the maid to let me in. I hope that's okay. I thought if I waited for you in the lobby, I might miss you. I have to talk to you right away. About what? About my father, David Benson. The guy they arrested for murdering Richard Stewart. He needs a lawyer, and since everyone says you're so good and all, and since you're in town anyway, I thought I'd hire you. So, let's go see my dad, okay? Uh... Hiring an attorney is not quite the same as ordering a pizza, Miss Benson. Oh, well, if it's the money thing you're worried about, my dad will pay you whatever you want. Though it would be kind of nice if you could, um, break it down into, you know, installments. Did he send you here? No, this was my idea. Young lady, this town is full of attorneys who are not just here overnight, you might say whose schedules are infinitely less hectic than mine. Why don't you try one of them? No, but you don't... And make an appointment first. Breaking and entering tends to create a less than favorable first impression. Perhaps the concierge in the lobby will help you. I don't need the concierge. I need you. My father was framed. The cops think they have an open and shut case. He doesn't need just any lawyer. He needs the best, and I was told that's you. You were misinformed. I'm sorry. I, I'm really sorry. But I have a lot of work to do. I think you'd better go. They also told me the reason why you're the best. It's because you care about justice. You just keep on going and going until you find out the truth. They didn't tell me you only did it when it could fit into your hectic schedule. Of course, um, the truth is, my dad is practically broke, and he probably doesn't have a chance no matter who defends him. So never mind. Sorry I interrupted you. Let's go find your father. My brother was an attorney, one with a conscience. And one day he decided that he was going to change those things around him that he didn't like. He would have to get involved, run for political office, which he did. And according to the polls, he would have won. Only his opponent fired his campaign manager and he brought in Richard Stewart who immediately discovered that Peter had seen a psychiatrist several years earlier, after his wife had died of cancer. And he made it public. Hell, he made it the central issue of the whole campaign. 
Every day he would leak out small rumors concerning Peter's emotional problems to the press. By the time that election rolled around, he had everybody believing that my brother was dangerously incompetent. Sounds like Richard Stewart, all right. You know, he discredited my brother so well that he not only lost the election, he lost his whole law practice. One by one, his clients dropped him. Everybody turned away. Except you. Let me put it this way. Peter supported the family. He made sure I got through school. I owed him everything. Just how bad did it get for your brother? Bad. First he started drinking. And he started using. No, I tried to get him to stop, but he just shut me out. I tried to help him all I could. You know, it cost me my marriage. It jeopardized my career. For nothing. He wound up killing himself. All because of Richard Stewart. This woman named Jennifer you were meeting with at the time of the murder, what can you tell me about her? You know, she was young, blonde, medium build. She drove a little yellow convertible. License plate? Um, I didn't see it. And then there was, a, there was a sticker on the front windshield on the driver's side. It was blue with pink numbers on it a parking permit. Not much, but it's a start. You know, I still can't figure out whether she was for real or whether she's part of this whole frame. Well, in either case, she's your alibi. Your only alibi. The sooner we find her, the better. I mean you're taking the case? You want me to? Of course. Look, I don't know what Melanie told you, but I can't possibly pay you much. I didn't know your brother, Mr. Benson, but I've known a lot of people like him. People who were not just defeated by Richard Stewart's smear tactics, but destroyed by them. I haven't appeared in a Nevada court for 20 years. Maybe it's time I did again. Her weapon was found in one of the dumpsters behind a hotel about an hour after the murder. Not a very smart place to dispose of a murder weapon. Well, maybe your client isn't so smart. More likely, somebody stole that gun from his room when he was out, then put it in the dumpster after the murder, knowing that's the first place you'd look. Nobody stole that gun from Benson's room, Counselor. And he wasn't rendezvousing with any girl in any parking lot, either. I've got a witness who says that at 20 minutes after one this morning, that's approximately five minutes before the shot that killed Stewart was heard, this witness saw David Benson in the hotel. That's not possible. Here's a statement. Money? No, I never put money in these things. Usually if I just hit them once or twice and hit them something. Here, here, here. Use money. People around here prefer it that way. Getting here so fast, I gave you a big tip. Oh, excuse me. Hello. Uh, I'm looking for Perry Mason. He's on the phone. Who are you? Uh, Della Street. Oh, you were the one who called this morning. Mm -hmm. You got here fast. Want some lunch or something? 
No, thank you, dear. Bella? <laughs> yes. Della Street, Melanie Benson, our client's daughter. Is there anything on the menu you didn't order? I need my strength. Yes, I know. The hotel owner has agreed to let us have this suite for the duration, so go ahead and set up whatever equipment you need. Your room's right over there. Okay. I'll change and set up right away. Uh, do you think we'll need a fax machine? We'll need to check out four men. They were with Richard Stewart when David Benson threatened him. Thank you. Names? L.D. Ryan, oil man and real estate developer from Houston. Stephen Elliott, used to be a U.S. senator. Now he's a lobbyist. Jay Corelli. President of the Corelli Car Corporation. Cliff Bartell, actor. Cross-section of the rich and famous. They were all clients of Richard Stewart. You think one of them killed him? That would be my guess. Well, where's Ken? In Stewart's suite. I'm just going to join him. Until her father is out on bail, we're going to have to keep an eye on her. Just for a couple of days. All right. She seems very sweet. You think so? Mm-hmm. Good. <laughs> See those bullets, please? Thank you. You were right. The police found these in the wastebasket. 14 bullets. The gun holds 16, but they say the gun could have been two bullets short to begin with. And they say Benson brought extra ammunition. Right. There you go. I also found out that one of the nightmates was dismissed this morning for losing her pass key. She says it was stolen off her cart last night. So oh, that's how the killer was able to steal David's gun. And how he was able to get into this suite and kill Richard Stewart. Now, Ken, find the woman who was with David at the time of the murder. What about that eyewitness the police have? I'll worry about him. Guess that means we'll be selling our tickets to the fight tonight. No. I'm Sarah Andrews. I was Mr. Stewart's personal secretary. Detective Hollenbeck said it would be all right if I collected Mr. Stewart's things. Go on in. Thank you. Excuse me. We won't have time. Sarah Andrews? I'm Della Street, Perry Mason's secretary. He's the attorney who's going Yes, to... I know. I was hoping you could tell us about the four men who played poker with Mr. Stewart the night he was murdered. Why? Because we suspect one of them was the murderer. I thought the police already had the murderer. Sarah, all of Richard Stewart's records are subject to a subpoena. You could be compelled to testify. Is that some kind of threat? I just want you to understand I... I know how unpleasant that could be for you. How long were you with him? 31 years. I've been with mine over 40. I know what it's like to devote your life to your job, to one man. Are you married? No. He was once, but it didn't last. He could be difficult, even mean, but he was always good to me. What you had with him was like a marriage. He was probably the closest person in the world to you. I know how terrible it must be for you to lose him. You can't imagine. Oh, yes. I can imagine. How'd it go? Well, I was not very truthful with her. 
Della, you are never not very truthful. Well, I certainly was not very truthful this time. But I am going to have dinner with her tonight before she leaves. She's a very nice woman, Perry. It's a hard time for her. I'm sure it is. Let's go. We've got that bail hearing. Well, where's Melanie? In there, going deaf. <laughs> Melanie! Melanie! I don't believe it. She's asleep. That's it. It's just like the one that was on Jennifer's car. Sticker for employee parking at the Desert Grand. Nice work, Ken. As soon as we're through here, I want you and Ken to sit down with the police composite artist and come up with a sketch of Jennifer. No problem. You must be uh, Perry Mason. Keith Warner. Sorry I'm late. Traffic was impossible. It's a pleasure to meet you, sir. I've uh, heard a lot about you. Nice of you to join us, Mr. Warner. Now that the prosecution is here, let's proceed to the matter of bail. Does the state wish to make any recommendations? It does indeed, Your Honor. Uh, the defendant uh, has been charged with first-degree murder. That's a very serious charge, Judge McKelvey. About as serious as they come. So whether he is guilty or not, it is only logical, if not mandatory, <laughs> that as responsible officers of this court, we assume that he will at some time or another consider fleeing from prosecution, which means that we are duty-bound, sir, to ask ourselves, what's to stop him? And the answer is nothing. This uh, man has no family here. He has no roots to this community, no real assets or any money anywhere. Even if he were able to post bail, he'd feel no obligation to honor its terms. He has nothing to lose. What I'm saying, Your Honor, is if there were ever a case where bail should be denied, this, without a doubt, is it. Does counsel for the defense wish to make a statement? Yes, Your Honor, we do. Uh, my client has never been arrested before, has never even been detained before. Contrary to what the state contends, he doesn't want to flee the charges against him. He wants to face them. And in view of the fact that he is responsible for his teenage daughter and she is here with him, the risk of his leaving this jurisdiction is minimal. I request that bail be set no higher than $10,000. I have to go along with Mr. Warner on this one. Request for bail is denied. The defendant will remain in custody until time of his trial. Next case. Dad. Dad, what's going on? Are they going to keep you in jail? Oh, it's all right. It's all right. Okay. I'll be okay. Uh, David. I am sorry. Can you see that Melanie gets to her mother's okay? I will. Melanie. I'll uh, see you in court, Counselor. Yeah. You better get packed. It looks like you're going to St. Louis. I'll book a plane. My mom's not there. I talked to her a couple of days ago. She and her boyfriend left for the Far East. I won't be able to get in touch with her for at least a month. You mean you didn't tell her? No. I didn't want to worry her. I guess it looks like you're stuck with me then, huh? I wouldn't have come to Las Vegas if it weren't for you. I wouldn't have stayed here if it weren't for you. But that doesn't mean I'm stuck with you. No, indeed. <clears throat> Richard Stewart had his clients tell him everything, past and present. Anything that could harm their public image. That way, he could hide their skeletons in the closet. 
That means each of our four suspects trusted him with potentially damaging information. Sarah said his relationship with all of them was stormy, to put it mildly. But he trusted her implicitly. Would you like to read something about Cliff Bartell's deep dark secrets? What about the others? I'm still typing up my notes. What? What? This doesn't concern you. Well, this concerns my father. I want to know who framed him. When we find out, you'll find out. Well, I can help you find out. I can, um, I can follow people. I, I can spy on them. I can do whatever you want me to do. Not at the moment, thank you. Well, I want to do something. My dad's in jail, and I just can't sit here doing nothing. Is that a menu? Order something. When it gets here, this time, chew very slowly. I'm going to talk to Bartell. Oh, he's in room 518. No, I just saw him in the lounge. I'll be there if you want me for anything. Uh, you'll need this. Tell, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Name's Perry Mason, David Benson's attorney. Oh, just sit down. You want a drink? No, thank you. She's, uh, she's very good. Yes, so they say. Can I get another one of these, please? So, uh, what kind of questions did you want to ask me? Easy ones. Like, where were you at the time of the murder? Why are you asking me that? You were one of the last people to see Richard Stewart alive? Someone put you onto me? No, should they have? <laughs> um, I left a poker game and I came straight down here. Like you said, she's good. Alone? Hey, look. If it weren't for Richard Stewart, I'd still be playing the comedy club circuit, so why the hell would I want to kill him? Because of Maynard Tobias, perhaps? The man who was driving your car when it hit that nice young couple from Indiana and killed them. The man who's currently serving time for felony manslaughter. Right. That was awful. How did I know he was going to go out and get drunk that night he borrowed my car? Interestingly enough, because it was a hit and run, no one actually saw who was driving your car. What are you getting at? It occurs to me that perhaps you were driving and that Richard Stewart paid Tobias to take the rap for you in order to save your career. That is a lie. And if you start spreading it, I will sue you off the face of this planet. Don't worry. If the check I'm running on Maynard Tobias reveals that he's come into any major assets since he's been in prison, I'll be very careful about whom I tell. Well... Thank you, Mr. Bartell. I will be talking to you again. Who is that? Oh, great. First a lawyer and now you. Is this my lucky day or what? Okay. Be nice. I drop by to let you know that everything's on for tonight. Next time, use the phone. I can't be seen with you right now. Goodbye. When others are there, it's you I see. Only you for me. Oh, wait till 
I tell you what I just overheard? This is really good stuff. I'm sure it is. What in the world? I thought she was she in a room. She is going to be there from now on. But I told you something big is going down tonight involving Cliff Bartell. Melanie, I would like you to go to your room. I can help. Either you go to your room, or you go to a deep, dark dungeon. Now take your pick. She's just worried about her father, Barry. She's only 13. Maybe you should go a little easier on her. You got it backwards. Well? Here are the rest of your reports. Oh, and Ken dropped by with this. Get from the police artist. Mm -hmm. So this is Jennifer. Right. Call Ken. Tell him to keep an eye on Bartell tonight. No, I haven't seen her. You might try personnel. I already did. Thanks anyway. Okay. Excuse me. Do you know this woman? Sure don't. I think she works here. Not on my shift. All right, thanks. Excuse me. Hello, Senator. Perry Mason. Yes. We met several years ago at a reception in Washington. You have a good memory. Yes. Of course, I'm aware of the fact that you're defending the man who's accused of murdering Richard Stewart. Mind if I ask you some questions? Depends on the questions. I understand you played poker with Richard Stewart only hours before his death. Yes, is that significant? Only if you can't account for your whereabouts after the poker game ended. Well, I suggest you ask my fellow players to account for their whereabouts. You get much more mileage out of their answers, I guarantee you. Why is that? Because I was at a floor show here at the hotel between 12 midnight and 2 a.m. I was with Gerald and Amanda Sturz, two old friends of mine from L.A. Speaking of old friends, what do you hear from Sharon Bennett? Sharon Bennett? She worked in your office as a page one summer. She was a junior in high school then. Yes, yes, of course. I haven't spoken to her in years. Who paid her to just disappear like that, you or Richard Stewart? I beg your pardon? I'm sure it was one of you. After all, you were married. You were on the Senate Ethics Committee. She was a minor. Had your constituents learned about her pregnancy and subsequent abortion, your political career would have been ruined. You know, I don't have to sit here and listen to this. And even now, were details of your affair with her to be made public, I doubt you'd be much in demand anymore as a spokesman for political causes. Is that some kind of a threat? Oh, no. I don't make threats, I just give good advice. And if you know more than you're telling, it'd be wise to tell me rather than a court. Next time, counselor, bring a subpoena. There won't be a next time. Police are not going to hassle me. Because they already arrested some guy. I don't know. As far as they're concerned, the case is closed. No, I am not going to use you as my alibi. I got to go. I, I really do. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, I love you too. Bye. Oh, here. Thanks.
I don't suppose you guys know how to find the pool. All right, everybody, freeze! You, drop your weapon now! This is the police. Throw down your weapons and step away. You're under arrest. You have the right to remain silent. Give up this fight anything you say can and will be used against you. people always hang out with drug dealers, counselor, or were you just soliciting new clients? I don't have to advertise, Sergeant. Cases seem to find me. You're lucky we were tailing those creeps, or you would have wound up in the parking lot hit first. Too bad they didn't have the drugs on them. You're telling me. They're all gonna walk. Mr. Bartell, don't you think it's time you explained what you were doing with those four? I don't have to explain anything, but I will tell you this. I was with them the night Richard Stewart was murdered. They're my alibi. He's lying. He was with some woman at the time of the murder. I heard him talking to her on the phone. L.D. Ryan is taking the red eye back to Houston tonight. It's my bet he'll be in the casino until he leaves. If I miss him, we may not see him again until the trial. Here, get the car for us, will you? It's out back. Go. Right there. All right. That's the way I like it. I like my money up front and in cash. Isn't that sweet? You want to get in on some of this action, my friend? I never gamble with money. Well, that's all I ever do. That's for you now. I got me a plane cash. Mr. Ryan, I'm Harry Mason. Mm -hmm. David Benson's attorney. I'm the one who left you all those messages today. Is that a fact? It certainly is. Why didn't you answer me? Well, now, I'll tell you, I think the hotel must have screwed up because the only message I got was from my CEO telling me to get home pronto. See, somebody is ready to sell me some land that I've been real anxious to get. I have a few questions for you concerning Richard Stewart. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't you talk to the police? Because them and me, we had a very thorough discussion about Richard about a couple of days ago. Did you tell them about the time you fired Richard Stewart and hired him back two days later? What's that got to do with anything? It has to do with the $27 million you made when Royal Dutch took over Fenway Oil. You made that money because somebody at Fenway Oil gave you inside information. Richard Stewart knew that. When you fired him, he threatened to tell, so you hired him back. Well, that isn't the truth. I hired him back because when I went out there looking for another publicist, I found out that he was the best there is. And that's been years ago. Insider trading is still a very serious allegation. And you have even more to lose now than you did then, which means that this time, when Richard Stewart threatened to go public with what he knew, you couldn't afford to take any chances. Now, wait a minute. Are you saying that I killed him? Where did you go after the poker game that night? To bed. Alone? <laughs> I am a happily married man. <laughs> At least I was that night, anyway. But, no, look, I am a tin angel compared to the other three guys in that game. Now, I have flame to catch. Here's something for you to read on that play. You something. What is it? What does it look like? It's a book. What's it about? Oh, I don't know. The lady at the gift shop recommended it. Where's Perry? He's out tracking down Jay Corelli. You got something? Yeah, I finally got a lead on Jennifer. Nobody could ID her picture. But I started talking to somebody who told me the car she was driving looks a lot like one that belongs to a woman named uh, Alice Sherman. She used to be a blackjack dealer at the Desert Grand. Quit about six months ago. Did you talk to her? She's out of town. Won't be back until tomorrow. Any idea who the mystery woman is? Not yet. Mystery woman? Yeah, when I was tailing Bartell, he was talking on the phone to some woman. He promised to keep her out of all this. Do you think she could have done it? It's hard to say. 
What's all this? Oh, Sarah sent me copies of Richard Stewart's tax returns for the last five years. I wanted to see if he claimed any winnings from his annual poker games. Um, I, uh, ordered some food. I'll be in my room if you need me. All right, dear. Richard Stewart won $325,000 in this poker game? Mm-hmm. He didn't do badly in 1988, either. Look at this. Yes, um, Cliff Bartell, room 518, please. Oh, well then, um, can I leave a message? Just tell him to come see me right away. It's an emergency. We have to talk about last Friday night. No, that's okay. He'll know who it's from. Thank you. Something came up, okay? Right there. Yeah. Just a second. The young lady ordered this, but she just left. Melanie! I gotta find her. Thinking of buying the hotel, Mr. Corelli? I'm always thinking of buying everything. Sometimes I do. I don't think we've ever actually met, but I'm keenly aware of your reputation, Mr. Mason. And I with yours. An ugly rumor that says uh, you're representing this uh, psychopath that murdered Dick Stewart. No. I represent David Benson. Meaning you don't think he's a psychopath? Or meaning you don't think he's a murderer? Oh, neither one. In fact, I was wondering if murder had something to do with the DLX-7 Corelli Sports School. DLX-7 is ancient history, Mr. Mason. Not if what some people say is true. Which is what? That you knew about the problem with the anti-locking brakes all along, but chose to ignore it in order to meet a deadline. And that would have been criminal negligence. And it would have been wrong. Which is precisely why, when people started dying as a result of the faulty brake system, Richard Stewart paid whomever he had to, whatever he had to, in order to cover it up. That's slander. Only if it's untrue. But if it is true, and if Richard Stewart and you had some kind of falling out that led to his threatening to expose you, it would certainly give you a strong motive for committing murder. Just who have you been talking to? Those three losers who were at the poker game that night? Now, if you want to make your life a little more interesting, do some homework on them. Where did you go after you left them that night? Down to the casino. Were you with anyone? Lady Luck was with me. Be sure to bring her with you. about what happened on the night of the murder. You left me a message. No, I didn't. Are you? How 
could she get out with both of you here? Stuff was coming in on the fax machine. I guess we got a little distracted. Perry, I have looked all over the place. Della has security looking for... Outside and inside. Mason, you had better put a leash and a muzzle on this kid, because if I see her again, I am going to sue the lot of you for harassment. I know where he was the night of the murder. He was with that singer, Belinda Foster. Would you do something about her? I think they both killed Richard Stewart. That's exactly what I think. Melanie, that is enough. We need the truth, Mr. Bartell. You know who Sam Shuba is? Crime boss from Chicago. Yeah, well, these days he kind of commutes. You see, he considers Belinda to be his girlfriend. And if he finds out about her and me, I'm going to be taking a very long, cold swim in Lake Mead. That's why I lied before. Well... Belinda Foster corroborate your story? Yeah, of course. But look, uh, there's really no need for anybody else to know about this, is there? No guarantees, Mr. Bartell. A man's life is at stake. Though we'd more likely cooperate with you if you cooperate with us. I am cooperating. So you are. Well, I want to know what really went on at those poker games. Okay. And we need the truth, Mr. Bartell. Will you excuse us for a moment? Come on, I've got a right to listen. If it weren't for me, he wouldn't even be here. I want you to sit down. I know you're trying to help, Melanie, but you've really got to stop what you're doing. Why? Because none of us can do our job properly when we have to constantly chase after you. We worry about you. So, don't worry about me. We also worry about your father. Now, I want your word that you'll do exactly as I say, or I won't be able to give your father a proper defense. Yeah, but... What if he goes to prison? I mean, we've got to do something about this. I've got to do something. I'm really scared. I know. I know you are. But it's going to be all right. The two of you will soon be going home together. Promise? Promise. Sergeant Hollenbeck, I am showing you a uh, nine millimeter Beretta, which has been marked People's Exhibit Number Eight, and which your department's ballistic expert testifies was the murder weapon. Do you uh, recognize it, sir? Yes, I do. That is the weapon which was found in the dumpster behind the hotel in which the defendant was staying. And did you? Uh, ascertained to whom this weapon was registered. Yes, it is registered to David Benson, the defendant. Thank you, Sergeant Hollenbeck. Nothing further. Your witness, Mr. Mason. <clears throat> Mr. Mason. Uh, Sergeant. Sergeant, did you see Mr. Benson put People's Exhibit number eight or any other weapon in the dumpster? No, sir, I did not. During your investigation, were you able to locate one, just one witness that saw Mr. Benson put something into the dumpster? No, sir, I was not. Thank you, Sergeant Hollenbeck. That, uh, that will be all. Oh, oh, Sergeant. I, I... Nothing further. The people call uh, Mr. Martin Hockman.
we played blackjack in the casino until about midnight, and then my wife said she was tired and went upstairs. I gambled some more and then went upstairs too. Did you see anything as you went upstairs, Mr. Hockman? <laughs> well, I got off the elevator on the 23rd floor mm -hmm. and had just started down the corridor to our room when I saw someone come out of a room a few doors down and head for the fire stairs. You see that person in this courtroom today? Yes, sir. That's him right there. Uh, let the record show that the witness, without hesitation, pointed directly to the defendant. Would you happen to have noticed what time it was when you saw him, sir? Yes, sir. It was 1.20 a.m. I had just looked at my watch. So he was right there in a hotel corridor at 1.20 a.m., and he was not out in a parking lot rendezvousing with some mystery oh. woman. Objection. Mr. Warner's question is cumulative, compound, and argumentative. Which draws a question. You saw the defendant at 1.20 a.m. in the hotel corridor, is that right? Yeah. Thank you. I have nothing further. Mr. Hockman, you say your wife went upstairs around midnight? That's right, yes. So you were in the casino for about an hour and 15 minutes without her? That's also right, yes. Doing what exactly? Gambling. <coughs> Blackjack, mostly. Some craps. And drinking? Oh, no. I had a mild uh, heart attack about a year ago, so I'm on a very strict diet. No fat, no salt, absolutely no alcohol. How often do you come to Las Vegas, Mr. Hockman? Two, maybe three times a year. My wife and I both like to gamble. You tend to wager large amounts of money? Nothing I can't handle. Aren't you considered something of a high roller? Well, I suppose. That means you get special treatment by the hotel and the pit bosses, doesn't it? They take very good care of me, yes. And very good care includes nonstop free drinks to high rollers while they're gambling. I have seen them do that, yes. So you were in the casino receiving and consuming alcoholic drinks provided by the house? Absolutely not. My wife and my doctor would kill me if I was drinking alcohol. Ms. Reynolds, do you uh, recognize her, Mr. Hoffman? I, um, I'm not sure. Please, Mr. Hoffman, look again. She's wearing the same cocktail waitress uniform that she was wearing in the casino where you were gambling that night. Well, uh... You stood out that night, Mr. Hockman. You certainly stood out. You gambled and lost close to $60,000 and consumed at least three double scotches in less than an hour and a half, didn't you? Yes. I ask you once again... Were you drinking that night? Yes. Thank you, Miss Reynolds. You may sit down. When you got off that elevator at 1.20 that morning, you were feeling the effects of those drinks, weren't you? In fact, you were drunk, weren't you? Yeah, I think I was. In that condition, you saw someone coming out of Mr. Benson's room. Is that right? Yes. But you don't know whether it was David Benson or some other person who had stolen Mr. Benson's gun and was on his way to kill Richard Stewart. Oh, wait a minute, please. Objection. Mr. Mason is now arguing his case and using unfounded speculation to do so. Sustained. The next morning, Mr. Benson's picture and an article on the murder were in the morning paper. Did you see that paper? Yes, I did. Now, didn't you just assume that Mr. Benson and the person you saw were the same? Maybe I did, Mr. Mason. Mr. Hoffman, can you honestly tell us you saw David Benson in that hotel corridor? No. No, I can't. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing further. Huh? 
Hi, your name Alice Sherman? Yes, who are you? My name's Ken Melansky. I'm looking for this woman. You recognize her? No, I don't. She was seen driving a small yellow convertible. You have a car like that, don't you? Well, I used to, but it was stolen about a month ago. You reported to the police? I believe my husband did. You know, if you don't mind, I, I gotta get ready for work. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be more helpful. You knew Richard Stewart for how long, Mr. Bartell? About eight years. Was your relationship strictly business? Strictly business. To tell you the truth, I didn't like him very much. What about the other men at that poker game? Did they like him? Objection. Whether they uh, liked him or not, Your Honor, is irrelevant to our inquiry here. Mr. Mason is putting the victim on trial. If the court will bear with me, the relevancy of this line of questioning will soon become clear. Overruled. Witness may answer. They didn't like him either. If none of you liked Richard Stewart, why did you all fly to Las Vegas to play poker with him every year? We flew to Las Vegas. We didn't play poker. What did you do? Richard Stewart was blackmailing us. We'd each show up for the game. We would each write him a check for $75,000. We would sit around for a while, and then we would leave. The poker game was just a front. Correct. He would deposit the money in the bank. He would declare it as gambling winnings, pay taxes on it, and invest it, spend it, whatever. How long had this been going on? About five years. Did you enjoy being blackmailed? Why would I enjoy paying someone to keep his mouth shut about something that I wished had never happened in the first place? So for the four of you, Richard Stewart's death was somewhat of a blessing. You said that, Mr. Mason, not me. Thank you. No further questions. No questions. <clears throat> Maybe we could talk. Will you go away? Will you get out of my Tell me who was driving your car the night Richard Stewart was murdered. All right, yeah, go ahead. Call the cops. I'll just tell them about your part-time job. You can't prove one damn thing. Yes, uh, someone's broken into my house. I need the police. 
Oh, um, I mean, never mind. I'm sorry. I, I made a mistake. Hi, honey. Hi. Thought you'd still be out shopping. Nothing was on sale. Who's this? Oh, uh, this is Jim Johnson. He's South Insurance. So is my cousin Ted. So I'm afraid we won't be needing any. Uh, that's what I told him. He was just about to leave. Well, I'm going to go change. We've got dinner tonight with Bob and Mimi at 8. You told him you were out shopping? Get out. Either you tell me where the woman is who was driving your car that night. Or I tell your husband how you really spent this afternoon. Looks a little like me, doesn't it? Alice Sherman told me you borrowed her car that night, Jennifer. My name isn't Jennifer, it's Stephanie. Look, I know you were with David Benson the night Richard Stewart was murdered. I don't know why you lied about your name then or why you're lying now. But you can bet one way or another I'm going to find out. Richard Stewart had been murdered. I got scared. I asked Alice not to tell anyone I bought her car that night. You must have known you could give David Benson an alibi. Why didn't you come forward? Because I didn't want to get involved. You obviously don't have kids. Otherwise, you'd understand. Why did you tell David your name was Jennifer? Because I didn't want it getting back to Richard Stewart that I was the one willing to sell him out. He held grudges in a big way. So what happens now? I get you a subpoena, you go to court, you tell the truth. For his sake, I'd get it over with. Which one is Stephanie? She's not here yet. How do you know she'll be here? Because I told her I'd do this if she didn't show. Uh. Dad! Good day, Carol. Yeah. Mr. Mason says after that woman testifies, he's going to ask for a dismissal. Ms. Young, the night Richard Stewart was murdered, do you remember where you went? Yes, I took a cab to a friend's house. Um, my car was in the shop and she was letting me borrow hers. I got the car, um, I picked up some ice cream, and I went home. Um, I ate the ice cream with my son, and then I went to bed. What happened later that night? Um, nothing. You called David Benson later that night, did you not? No. You called him and asked him to meet you at the Desert Grand Hotel parking lot? <laughs> no, I didn't. Ms. Young, I feel obliged to remind you that you are under oath and warn you that the penalty for perjury in this state is extremely severe. Now, weren't you with this man at approximately 1.15 a.m. in a downtown parking lot on the night Richard Stewart was murdered? I've never seen that man before in my life. Well, if that is true, 
Why does the police drawing of the woman David Benson was with that night look exactly like you? I have no idea. And why does his description of the car she was driving match the car you borrowed? I don't know. Well, I do, Ms. Young. It's because you aren't telling the truth. You are lying. Objection. You lied when you told my client you had information for sale. You lied just now uh, when you denied ever talking to him. Witness. And the reason you keep lying is because you're helping whoever did the murder frame again. David Benson. Your Honor, now, I'm this to is object you. To this. I have nothing further. Objection sustained. Mr. Mason. Uh, yes, Your Honor. I have been very patient, sir. Did you say you have nothing further? Oh, oh, yes. It's, uh, it's not often that I'm forced to impeach my own witness. That's it? That's it, Your Honor. And thank you. Cross-examination. Uh, no, that won't be necessary, Your Honor. You may step down. Thank you. Same person that killed Richard Stewart. Had to be. Killed Stephanie to cover his tracks. Did you see the driver? No, the headlights were in my eyes. I couldn't even tell you the color of the car. Did she say anything to you before she died? Oh, just her son's name. What is her son's name? Well, nickname, I think. Skip. Skip? Let me see those photographs. Bella, what do we do with those faxes? Oh, wait. No, no, wait, I mean, wait, wait, wait. No, if you want now, hold anything, on, I'll... hold on. We can finish that discussion another day. We have a whole long night ahead of us. Here. Here. Take some more. Mm. Your Honor, sir, I would uh, 
I believe we provided the defense here and Mr. Mason with more than ample consideration. But he's very, very late, sir, and I'd like to request... Your Honor, leave. my associate, Mr. Mason, has been unavoidably delayed. We expect him here at any moment. Excuse me, but Mr. Mason is here. Mr. Mason, you surprise me, and you're very late. I, I am sorry, Your Honor. Last night we received new evidence, and it has taken all of the night and most of the morning to prepare it so that it could be presented to this court. I, I must ask the court's forgiveness for our appearance and my great tardiness. Mr. Mason, Mr. Warner, this court is known for its punctuality. Do not let this happen again. Understood? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Mason, are you ready? Uh, just uh, three minutes, Your Honor. Senator, how long had you known Richard Stewart? He started doing public relations for me during my second campaign for the Senate, uh, which was back in 79, 11 years ago. How long had he been blackmailing you? Five years. In five years, you paid him close to $400,000 not to reveal certain indiscretions that would have ruined your career, is that correct? Yes. Now, Senator, your income has decreased substantially over the past four years, has it not? I suppose. Wasn't it getting more difficult each year to pay Richard Stewart? I managed to. Senator Elliott, we are showing you a check marked Defense Exhibit D for identification, apparently drawn on your account. And we ask you if you can identify it. I gave this to Richard on the night that he was killed. We subpoenaed your bank records at 7 a.m. this morning, Senator. You knew when you wrote that check that it was no good. But you also knew Richard Stewart would never live to try to cash it. I won't dignify that accusation with a reply. Senator, did you leave the show that night? No. The two people you were with, Amanda and Gerald Stern, remember you leaving? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, I do remember. I. Uh... I did leave for a minute or two. I went to the front desk to check and see if I had any messages, and then uh, I believe I went to the restroom. <laughs> Just the desk, and then the restroom. Yes. This is a photograph marked Defense Exhibit E for identification taken that night by the hotel photographer. That hotel photographer. Do you remember her? Yes. You remember that photograph? I remember it vividly. Jerry Stearns threw a fit when he saw this. <laughs> it's a terrible picture. He had another one taken. Now, this photograph, marked Defense Exhibit F for identification, is the second photograph taken that night, is it not? Yes. And it's a much better picture. More than that, Senator. And photograph number one, you're wearing a shirt with cufflinks. In photograph number two, your shirt has button cuffs. You changed your shirt, Senator. You went upstairs. You killed Richard Stewart. And you changed your shirt. Because your shirt had his blood all over it. Isn't that true? No. No? No? Tell us about your connection to Stephanie Young. There is no connection. Your corporation has been sending her an $8,000 check every month for the past six years. Yet you say no connection. 
That night she lured Benson away from his hotel for you, yet you say no connection. At one o'clock, you left the show, stole a passkey from a maid's cart, went to David Benson's room, stole his gun. Then you went to Richard Stewart's room, and because he knew of your connection with Stephanie Young, you shot him dead. That is not true. You have a nickname, Senator. What is it? Skip. Some people call me Skip. Stephanie Young gave birth to a son six years ago. She called him Skip. He's your son, isn't he, sir? You sent Stephanie monthly checks to support him and to make sure she kept very quiet. Richard Stewart heard about that son and decided to up his blackmail. You were afraid Stephanie would ask for more. You could no longer afford to pay them more. So you killed them. Simple. You just killed them. I had no idea what I was going to do to him. That guy arrived in the room and he's carrying a gun. And then, as you say, it became simple. It was going to be so easy without the two of them milking me dry. I was going to be able to take care of my boy. And it all figured out. Simple. I just killed them. In view of these developments, Your Honor, the state moves that all charges against the defendant be dismissed. So ordered. Bailiff, take Mr. Elliot into custody. Case dismissed. Just because I snuck out on you didn't mean that I don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> I do know that. <laughs> Perry, thank you. Property section kindly brought me your gear. I'm sure it's all there. Well, goodbye, you two. Bye bye now. Bye. Okay. I just wanted to thank you. You kept your promise, and I'll never forget you. Never. You know, she wasn't so bad. <laughs> Easy for you to say. Easy for me to say.